And they went to Tallahassee and they had forums and some of them even had an opportunity to go to DC and on TV and to express their views. And the two main things that we heard from them continually, continually, get rid of the assault rifles, the semi-automatics, the large magazines, and don't arm teachers and school staff. Now, about a week, 10 days ago, when this was going through the legislature, I had an opportunity to spend a few hours watching our legislature at work. And on the one day that uh, the House was debating the bill that the Senate had passed, there were numerous amendments brought forward to restrict assault rifles, to restrict magazines, to tighten up gun background checks, to strengthen our school resource officers, to provide more help, mental health support in our schools. And some of that did go through on the main bill. But the two biggest things that were needed were neglected. And time and time again, I can only speak to our district, and we don't have a senator, but in the House, our representative, Chris Sproles, voted against every, every amendment that was brought forth to resolve some of these particular safety issues. Now, come Saturday, there's going to be a nationwide rally marches, there's some in St. Pete, Tampa. I was hopeful that we would have one in Tarpon, but uh, I reached out to the high school, I didn't get any response back, and uh, also Craig Park's gonna be busy this weekend. So I just wanna say that as we come to primaries and then elections in November, remember who is on what side of these issues because putting guns, more guns in schools, is not the answer. The way to do it is have, to have trained officers who are in schools. If you're not aware of it, they had an incident today in Maryland. And how was that resolved? A trained SRO. Mm -hmm. A trained SRO. And what's the other issue we're having now, if you listen to some of what's going on from the school boards? and the sheriffs. We need approximately 80 more resource officers just to cover the schools in San Pete that the legislature is mandating, but we're not getting the money for it. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Coliana, Circle Drive, Tarpon Springs. You write my name here real quick. I did prop that door open because your automatic lock works excellent. It lets no one in. <laughs> I came here tonight simply to uh, thank the board. I know that uh, on your agenda tonight is the issue regarding purchase. The purchase is over for that drug den, and I, I will. I also know by asking around that you didn't get many thanks for what you had to go through to do this. The health, safety, and welfare of the city, for each of you who are elected officials, in case you don't mind an old man telling you, don't ever forget that, although I don't think all of you remembered it, but however, the issue got through. Commissioner Banther, I mentioned to you a few months back, don't give up what you said was perfectly well. That was a patience deal, so you would understand these good things are gonna happen, and they did. I had opportunity in my life to serve on very large negotiating committees, both on the union side at one time and then on management side. And I can tell you this was a case of perfect negotiations on your part. The chief, 
his people did an excellent job. Think about this. They stayed on those people constantly to that poor man who owned the building couldn't make any money, if you could believe that. Mr. Dagno, <laughs> if he, he couldn't have given you better references and better direction than what he did for negotiations. And there's always a negotiator in a union contract, whether it's on the company side or the union kind. There's always one person who sits back and negotiates both ways. A lot of people don't believe in this, but this is the way it happens. I don't care where you're from or what state you're in. Conversations happen both across the board as a group and across the board as individuals because the two heads have to decide what can happen to make this work. The Board of Commissioners, I'm proud of you guys, okay? I think a couple of you made a mistake in your votes, but that's my personal opinion. And the irony of all of that is at the CRA meeting tonight, you're going to get a chance to vote for utilizing that property and renting that building for CRA purposes that you voted against. I can't say that I agree with that, and I'm not here to embarrass you for doing that because you did what you thought was right. The mayor was a poker player in this, okay? And not just because Chris and I are friends and we've been friends for life, and I baptized his son. I don't have any problem admitting that because the only person that's more hard-headed than me is him, and he'll say the same thing, that he thinks I'm more hard-headed, but it's not true. He knew what he wanted. He stuck to his guns. He played his poker game. And with the direction of your city manager, who was the chief negotiator, who, who knows through experience how to negotiate not only a labor contract, but a contract that affects the city as a whole. <clears throat> and I'm here to tell you, I appreciate it, guys. I really do. Usually I come up here and tell you I don't like what you did. But I can tell you right now, I like what you did. You did the right thing. You represented every person in this town against the worst thing that could happen and is that the drug dealers from the other local towns wanted to come in town and buy drugs. This guy is the toughest cop you're ever going to meet in your life. Can I tell him? You, he has an education, okay? Mr. He's Williams, not like... Your time has expired. My time's up? Mm -hmm. Okay, give me one more second. He has a master's degree in accounting, okay? That's kind of nerdy to me for somebody with a master's degree in accounting. You don't have to put your head down. I'm picking on you. <laughs> <laughs> To end up being the police chief, but one hell of a police chief, one hell of a city manager. You guys did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? We're here now. Thank you very much. And we're going to the proclamation. Item number one is on the National Library Week. City of Tarpa Springs, Florida proclamation, whereas libraries are not just about what they have for people, but what they do for and with people. And whereas library, libraries have long served as trusted and treasure institutions, and library workers and librarians feel efforts to better their communities, campuses, and schools. And whereas librarians continue to lead the way in uh, leveling the playing field for all all who seek information and access to the uh, technologies. Whereas libraries and librarians look uh, beyond their traditional roles and provide opportunities for education, employment, empowerment, and engagement, as well as the new services that connect closely with the patrons' needs. And whereas libraries are pioneers supporting democracy and social changes, with a commitment to provide access to information for all libraries for all library users. And whereas libraries, librarians, library workers, and supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. And now, therefore, I, Chris Alahuz, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the week of April 8th through 14, 
2018 is National Library Week. <coughs> and Carrie? Thank you. You want to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Mayor and Board of Commissioners, for this uh, proclamation in support of National Library Week. I'd like to let you know that um, in April, um, from the 9th to the 14th, for National Library Week, we're going to be having special activities at the library, including movies, crafts, and music programs. And we're also going to be having a week-long trivia contest with prizes sponsored by the Friends of the Library every day, and also with support from Tarpon Arts. And while I'm up here, I'd just like to mention, because next week is spring break, and um, when the children are out of the school, we have uh, activities going on every single day for uh, the families and children. On Monday, uh, the 26th, we're going to have a family uh, Family movie, I'm sorry, family game day. On uh, Tuesday, we're going to have uh, handmade greeting cards. On Wednesday, we're going to have a family movie. Uh, Thursday and Friday will be uh, puzzles and crafts. And on Saturday, we're having a Lego day with uh, Lego movie and Lego building. So um, I encourage everybody to come by the library during spring break and National Library Week. All of our activities and programs are available on their website, tarponspringslibrary.org, and our Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all the staff, the library staff, the uh, friends of the library, all the volunteers, which we uh, had our appreciation breakfast the other day. If you please tell them that we thank you for the outstanding services they're providing. Thank you. Any commission comments? Any public comments on this item? Hear none. The next item is number two, Water Conservation Month, <coughs> Vice Mayor Panther. Thank you. Proclamation. Whereas water is a basic and essential need of every living creature, whereas, and, and, and whereas the state of Florida water management districts and the city of Tarpon Springs are working together to increase awareness about the importance of water conservation, whereas the city of Tarpon Springs and the state of Florida has designated April typically a dry month when water demands are most acute as Water Conservation Month, to educate citizens about how they can help save Florida's precious water resources. Whereas the city of Tarpon Springs has always encouraged and supported water conservation through various educational programs and special events. Whereas every business, industry, school, and citizen can help by saving water and thus promote a healthy economy and community. Now, therefore, I, I uh, vi vi Vice Mayor um, uh, David Banther, by virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of, of, of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2018 as Water Conservation Month. And I call upon each citizen and business to help protect our precious resource by practicing water saving measures and becoming more aware of the need to save water. This will be accepted by Paul Smith, Public Services Director. You want to stay <clears throat> Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. Just a few brief comments. You know, this is particularly important to us and meaningful now that we have our own water supply, our own water resources that we have to protect. Uh, water conservation is something that we're really looking hard at continuing to improve. We have Reclaim Water Program, very highly developed. We have water conserving rates. And we're also looking into the future of rolling out some more conservation initiatives to uh, help incentivize this with our customers. So thank you. Thank you. Any commission comments? No. Any public comments on this item? Peter Lax, 514 uh, <clears throat> Ashland Avenue. Thank you again for an opportunity uh, to a subject that uh, is so much more critical than people realize. You know, we are uh, surrounded by water. It rained today. We kind of have this feeling that it's, uh, you know, everlasting and always pure and stuff. So I applaud all the efforts that the city does to provide clean water. And as Paul has just said, also, it's important to protect our water sources, being that a number of them are on the north side of the river. It's important that we continue to monitor and make sure uh, that the water uh, is quality water and not any uh, 
pollutants that have flowed into it. But we have other pollutants. And it's kind of interesting. I was at my mom's and one of the neighbors came by and she asked me to sign a petition. And uh, I guess there's going to be a Wawa that wants to be built on the corner of Alternate 19 and Mears. And from my understanding, that would be the northwest corner, which we've all seen of late a lot of clearing on. Now, if any of you know that corner, what's behind it? Anybody got an answer? Canals that lead to Whitcomb Bayou, that lead to Anclote River, which connects with Spring Bayou. Last thing you want is having an epiphany and a gas spill or an oil spill from that gas station working its way down through those canals, under the bridge, into the bayou, and up to Spring Bayou, and you got cross divers coming up with oil and gas, or you can't even have it because of flammable situations. That is a realistic attitude. So I only learned about it yesterday. I haven't talked to staff to verify or confirm what the status is. But these are also important issues with regards to protecting our water. And we are thankful that we, over the years, were able to create our own water supply source because we're way ahead of the game. But if it gets contaminated, forget it. And then we'll be hooked for all those bonds that are still left unpaid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Any other comments? Here now. We are now going to item number three, which is law and order night. Uh, another proclamation. Commission Kick is going to read this proclamation. Thank you. Proclamation. Whereas the purpose of Law and Order Night is to recognize individuals that go above and beyond the call of duty. And whereas Tarpon Springs Elks Lodge number 1719 on Saturday, April 14th, 2018 will honor a police officer, firefighter, teacher, and a citizen that distinguish themselves both on their jobs and in their community by their acts of citizenship. And whereas these individuals are nominated by community members or someone that they work with or know that believe they are deserving of this recognition for the reason that they stood out either in their professional life or as an example to others for the good volunteer work they perform. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs is sincerely grateful to the Tarpon Springs Elks Lodge number 1719 for taking the time each year to honor these outstanding individuals. Now therefore I Commissioner Susan Kickta by the virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida do hereby recognize April 14th, 2018 as Law and Order Night. And I will be giving them a plaque um, that evening at the dinner, um, presenting them with a plaque. Um, they have a dinner, anybody's welcome in the community to come. Uh, these people don't know that they uh, have been nominated so they won't know until that evening. Uh, who's won, and we get a great turnout every year just to, to thank people in our community for everything they do. Commissioner Kick, this is a great event, and I'm attending this event every year. This year I won't be able to because I'm going to be. Right, I um, think I'm the only one going. So you, you're going to represent all of us there. Yes. And, uh, and I'm an officer of the lodge anyway, so I do, we do a lot of volunteer work up there. Um, and uh, again, this is one of, we, we love doing this, this event every year. It's just a great way to bring the community together and we have a lot of fun. Um, I'm not sure if Chief's going. I know everybody's in, been invited. We'll so. be there. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, I can sit with you. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, um, the food's donated by uh, Mr. Dobie's. <laughs> And um, all our volunteers um, at the lodge will be serving. And we also have children from the high school that also serve for volunteer hours. So again, um, we have, it's a good night. It's a great event, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any commission comments? I just, Super. yeah, I wanted to thank the Elks Lodge for putting this on every year. And I'm, I'm gonna be out, the, out of the country too, so I won't be there, Susan, but have fun. It's always a great event. Yes. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Here now, thank you, uh, Commissioner Kicker. The next item is the presentation: <coughs> water and sewer rates. Andrew uh, Bronham, Stantac Consultant Services. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. Again, I'll be introducing the presentation. I'm going to risk bringing this up on the. 
Okay, we'll keep it down here. <coughs> so tonight we're presenting the fiscal year, or 2018 rather, revenue sufficiency analysis and a proposed future rate plan for your consideration. We're not asking for any sort of vote tonight. This is a presentation just to give you an uh, advanced preview of what we'll be uh, recommending to you by ordinance later. Uh, before I get any further, let me do some introductions. So um, with us tonight, Ron Herring, Finance Director. He'll also be participating in the presentation. And our rate consultant is Stantec, formerly known as Burton & Associates. And we have Eric Grau with us and Deborah Klockner. And uh, Eric will be presenting the Burton portion or the Stantec portion of the presentation. So as you may know, uh, this firm has performed studies for us for 20 plus years. We've uh, worked very well with them and uh, they helped us through some very complex planning for the new water supply uh, very successfully. And this is really a continuation of that work together as we move through the years, planning ahead in these 10 year windows and uh, providing recommendations to you to sustain our operations. Before we get to the results of the study, I wanted to go over a few slides of some of the things we're including in the study because I think it's important to consider when you're looking at the results, what's included in the model. They use a model, as we say, to go ahead and predict how the fund will behave with expenditures and revenues, and all that can be further described in these upcoming slides. But some of the main assumptions that we as staff put into the model are things like CIP. And I wanted to point out, these are just some of the sample projects that are in a 10-year plan that we put into this rate model. As you all know, it's very important to us and the public to maintain uh, investment in our infrastructure with all the recent things with the sewer systems and we also know the value of our water pipes. Um, we want you to know that we've put heavy investment plans into this rate model. Um, you can see some of the example figures, those are 10 year totals for those particular types of items, water pipe replacements, sewer line maintenance, lift stations, future water wells, hydrants, sewer expansion, reclaim water expansion, but also some other things that are important to the community like solar energy improvements and uh, this upcoming Beckett Bridge um, replacement by the county, we have some utilities in there we need to plan to relocate. Another item I wanted to point out is the personnel. We see some future needs for maintaining our infrastructure, and I wanted to show you some examples of what we're including in the rate model. We've got five proposed position additions and three upgrades of positions. I wanna point out these are boots on the ground. What we're proposing here are apprentice positions, technicians, and mechanics, all uh, working towards keeping our infrastructure um, working properly. And I'll just briefly uh, give you the examples of these positions. This includes a water service worker position. It's an apprentice um, for in-house water distribution system repair. A technician two for utility locates that helps protect our infrastructure during construction. Also a wastewater service worker, another apprentice position. That'll be for the sewage collection system repair and maintenance. A technician two for a sewage collection system repair. And then uh, a maintenance mechanic position for maintaining our utility equipment. And then the last three are upgraded positions to offer uh, crew leadership at the frontline level for both the water distribution side and the sewage collection. Another area is the project administration department that's directed by Bob Robertson. And uh, this is a proposed position in the plan for fiscal year 19. It's one new position to assist with review, planning, construction oversight, and compliance. One half would be funded uh, through the water and sewer with the other half split between general fund and stormwater. With that, I'll turn it over to Ron Herring to talk about the background of the adjustments. Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. I'm Ron Herring, Finance Director. I uh, just want to go over the history of the rates, so the previous approved 10-year rates. Like I could say we had a 10-year rate back, approved back in 10, uh, 2010 for 10 years for water and sewer. The final year is the approved rate in fiscal year 19 of 
And back then, the alternative water supply plan was developed water supply independence and to be able to control over our rates. I'm not sure if we still, up until about two years ago, we purchased our water from Pinellas County, about 85% of our water. If we were, the current wholesale rate is $4.06 per thousand. If we were still purchasing it from the county, we'd be paying about 3.7 million this year to purchase water from the county. And the other thing about the, uh, the rate study was uh, the decrease in the, uh, understood the rates that may not be decreased with the RO facility, but the, however, the increase of the rates could be reduced once the facility began operation. Now this is just the history of the rates that were approved back in 2010 with the water rates and then the sewer rates going back from 2010 down to 2019, the current year being fiscal year 2018 at the 6.75% for both water and sewer. Fiscal year 19, next fiscal year, the rates are at 6.75% each for water and sewer. Now, financial highlights of the proposed plan funds 58 million of CIP, that's capital improvements for fiscal years 2018 to 2028. That 23 million you saw on the previous slide is included in that. Unrestricted fund balance above the 25% minimum. The water and sewer fund paid based on our fund balance policy has a 25% minimum requirement. Debt service coverage about above requirements with the bond with the bond covenants we have, there's a minimum net, net revenue requirement we need to meet. Uh, in the proposal, there's no financing required and the re reduces the rate of increases and in even the previously approved 2019 increase uh, in the proposal, that instead of the 6.75%, we're proposing to reduce it to 5% 5 per, 5 for both water and sewer. And with that, I'll give you Eric Grau, the managing consultant with uh, Stantec. Thank you. I'm Eric Grau with Stantec, managing consultant for this year's utility rate study. Um, you may notice from the agenda that Andrew Burnham was originally scheduled to present to you guys, but due to illness, he unfortunately uh, could, not, could not make the uh, presentation this evening. So I will fill in for him. So the fundamental objective of this year's study was to evaluate the sufficiency of the projected revenues from the currently adopted rate plan to satisfy all of the operating and capital requirements of the system through 2028, so for another 10-year horizon. And uh, principally to, to ensure that um, the projected operating and capital requirements are recovered that adequate levels of operating reserves are maintained and that the terms um, and that the, the utility complies with the terms of its outstanding debts. Uh, to the extent that the current rate plan would not generate the projected revenues to satisfy all of those requirements, uh, we would then develop um, alternative uh, rate plans or, or, or recommend a rate plan that would satisfy such requirements. Um, and then we wrapped up with a an update to our annual water and sewer utility rate survey that we complete each year for um, of other entities within the surrounding area. But this time we did it with more of a, an eye towards the future as to what were the known increases for the area um, beyond 2018. And so with respect to key assumptions uh, pertaining to funding sources in our 10-year in our model, First, as, been, as has been stated, the final year of the last 10-year rate plan is scheduled for fiscal year 2019, and so effective October 1 of 2018, water and sewer, absent any changes, will be a 6.75% increase. Our operating fund balances, or unrestricted reserves, as of September 30, 2017, so ending fund balances for fiscal year 17, was approximately $5.8 million. That's important because that's our beginning fund balance from which we build our 10-year projection. And finally, absent any further rate adjustments than the 6.75% that's been adopted, we are assuming organic growth of about a quarter percent per year from an assumed 25 new water and sewer connections uh, each year for the forecast, with the one caveat being that on the sewer side, we're assuming 90 additional uh, sewer connections over this year and next year due to um, recently completed sewer system expansion projects. 
Now, with respect to funding needs, uh, some of the, the key assumptions with respect to our operating expense requirements <clears throat> are, well, let me back up. So we started with the 2018 budget and project each year all our operating expenses off of that based upon uh, line item specific cost escalation factors that we've assumed in past years, um, updated based upon our industry experience and reviewed with staff. Those, pro those projected cost increases, including the personnel reorg changes that uh, Paul just reviewed, um, in the aggregate, on average over the 10 years, is about a 4.3% increase to our annual ongoing operating expenditures. On the capital expenditure side, we assume a 3% annual cost inflation to the CIP budget that we were provided. It was the FY18 budget, the 10-year CIP, and then adopted and modified at an interactive work session with staff. Assuming the cost inflation as well as spending execution assumptions that align closer to uh, actual spending versus budget on the capital side, it amounts to about $5.2 million per year of capital spending. And then with respect to the financial policies, there are two that we monitor, uh, specifically the first being the working capital reserve target. Um, this is uh, equal to 25% of annual operating expenditures for the year. Um, it's a minimum target. It ranges from $2.3 million in 2018 to as high as $3.6 million in fiscal year 28. Um, to put this in perspective, the, the 2.3 million is our minimum target, but we're starting 2018 with $5.8 million. So we have some, some room of uh, unrestricted reserves above that minimum target. And then finally, debt service coverage requirements. Per the terms of the outstanding debt of the utility, um, the utility must generate net annual revenues that are at least 1.1 times greater than the annual debt service requirement. Or... 1.05 annual debt service if, when combining net revenues with impact fees, coverage is at least 1.2 times debt service coverage or uh, the debt service requirement. However, for our planning purposes, we've assumed a minimum planning target of 1.50 times just on net revenues alone. Now, that being said, industry. Um, best practice now states that a utility should strive for at least 2.0 coverage um, per year on net revenues versus debt service requirements per recent guidance from the uh, utility municipal rating agencies. Um, but with that said, we're currently projecting debt service coverage for this year to be in excess of 3.5 times debt service coverage. So currently, debt service coverage is strong. So, what I'm going to show you next are two alternative scenarios to kind of frame the, the conversation. Um, and what you'll see up here, I know it's a lot, um, is our summary dashboard from the financial model. And I've called out, knowing that there's a lot up here, I've kind of called out the areas of note with these orange uh, rectangles as well as these call outs. So this scenario, uh, I'll call it our status quo scenario. It assumes that let me see if I'm now. It assumes it assumes 6.75 percent is implemented as adopted on October 1st of this year. Then each year thereafter, let's see, we assume no rate adjustments. A plan where we assume 6.75% water and sewer in 2019 and nothing thereafter results in annual debt service coverage that eventually, and you can see we're at 3.56 starting out in 2018, that eventually works its way down below uh, 3.0 by fiscal year 2024, below the 2.0 best practices by 2026, by 2027 would decline below our minimum target down to 1.35, and effectively by the last year of our 10-year planning horizon would be in technical default with the rating agencies uh, based upon a projected coverage of right around 1.0. Now, this decline in coverage 
is a result of fundamentally, well, on one side of the equation, we're leaving rate revenues flat for the most part. On, but on the, on the denominator side, we are now projecting the need for borrowing beginning in fiscal year 2024, as is seen in this chart right here. And, and this one right here is a, it shows the mix of funding sources for the uh, anticipated capital spending amounts. And these red bars, these red sections, represent the borrowing that we're showing here. So the vast majority of the capital program beyond 2024-25 uh, would be debt funded without any further rate adjustments. This also impacts our unrestricted reserve funds. You can see here we have our healthy $5.8 million balance um, in excess above our, our target. However, by 2023, we're down to that target and really by fiscal year 2026, we begin to fall beneath the target, and by 2028, unrestricted reserves would be exhausted. This is more, uh, this is also seen, I guess, in this chart here, where we track our revenues versus expenses. And what's key about this chart is to focus on this bottom green line and then the top blue one. The bottom green line is our cash outflows excluding cash-funded capital. So in other words, that's your ongoing annual kind of operating expenditures. And it's, it's traveling, you know, up to the right corner of, of the graph. This blue line represents our cash in. And so what you don't want to see, what makes a plan unsustainable is when your cash outflows uh, are, are growing at a quicker rate than your cash inflows. And in fact, under this scenario, the cash outflows would actually cross over the cash inflows by fiscal year 2026. And so to adjust this cash flow problem would require pretty large rates um, if one were to wait to that point to, to change the rates. But this is not a sustainable plan. Now this second plan says, what if we reduce the, the already adopted 6.75% increase for 2019 down to 5%. And then each year thereafter, assume level inflationary type increases. In this case, 2.9% annual adjustments for both water and sewer. Under such a plan, our coverage ratios, our coverage ratios will maintain between 3.5 and 4.0. So in each year, we'll have strong debt service coverage. And there's no borrowing that, would be, that is currently projected that would be required uh, to fund the identified CIP. Then looking at the, fund the unrestricted fund balance chart, we would maintain in every single year of the 10-year forecast at, um, unrestricted reserves that are at least equal to, if not greater than, our 25% working capital reserve target. And on this revenue versus expense chart, here you see the, this is what you want to see for a long-term sustainable plan, where your ongoing annual cash outflows are parallel with your cash inflows. And so that shows that there's not a, a, a cash, uh, cash shortfall in the system. And so finally, um, with respect to the rate survey that we updated this year, Again, we focused more on what the uh, known rate adjustments are beyond 2018. And of the 13 entities that we uh, survey annually, five um, are currently planning on rate adjustments ranging between 4 and 11.5% per year over the near future. And four other utilities are either currently conducting um, their own rate studies or plan on doing so relatively soon with an expectation that there would be some need for rate adjustments in the future. And so that's nine out of the 13 that, uh, that we would normally um, uh, talk to. Thank you. Thank you. If I may finish up with some conclusions here. So, to recap, no future increases leaves insufficient funding, as Eric pointed out in detail there. Uh, inflationary increases will fund our needs without debt. We're able to reduce our fiscal year 19 increase to 
and then 2.9% thereafter, which is considered an inflationary increase. I also want to point out the city manager had us review this with the Budget Advisory Committee, and we gave them this same presentation, basically, and they recommended the plan as proposed. Um, a couple of the comments I recall, one of them was, you know, you all talked about being able to decrease those rate increases when the water plant came online, and you all delivered on that. And um, so they were very complimentary of, um, of the plan. So our recommendations for you to consider are preparing an ordinance to make specific changes to Chapter 20, Water and Sewer, which would include the, uh, the rate plan that we're proposing to you tonight. Also, uh, I recommend that we apply those same increases to reclaim water rates for the same period. The reclaim water rates are in that same ordinance. I want to point out that those rates have not been revised in 25 years. Um, what would that do to the rates, you might ask? Well, if you applied that 10-year plan, by the 10th year, reclaim water would still be $1.29 per thousand. That's about 1 20th the cost of water regular water. Uh, miscellaneous administrative revisions. There are some outdated references in the ordinance now and some general document maintenance things that we would recommend as part of that redraft. And uh, we would recommend providing for an effective date immediately upon adoption. With that, we would recommend a public hearing for adoption of the ordinance and in good practice, continue to perform those periodic updates to our financial management plan. So what do we say uh, we recommend next? We recommend advertising our public hearing dates for the proposed rate increases. That is required by state statute through our utility bills. And um, those, those advertisements need to tell the public when the hearings are. Uh, we recommend the first reading to be May 8th and the second reading May 22nd. And upon uh, <coughs> passing of that ordinance, we would then also recommend on that same agenda uh, approval of the associated reorganization that I presented in this presentation to you. So with that, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer them for you. Yeah. Mr. Smith, I want to thank you. I want to thank Mr. Herrick and uh, also the representative from Stentac for, uh, <clears throat> for the presentation. Um, i also like to thank the staff for working with the uh, consultant to complete the study and bringing us your recommendations. Uh, as you stated that it was man it's mandated that we must have 25% unrestricted funds, which is in our, uh, which is 3.6 million. Well, our, fund, our, uh, in, our um, unrestricted funds at this time is 7.9, almost 8 million, correct? <coughs> so we do have a lot of room to, that we can work with. Um, I support the creation of the new uh, employee positions. I think that's going to be beneficial to um, increase the efficiency of the operation. As we're getting bigger, we're going to need to, uh, to have the manpower and the expertise to, uh, to have a very good operation, and I am all for that as well. Um, I'm glad that uh, we are recommending that uh, you recommend that the escalation increase would be reduced from 6.75 to 5 percent, uh, which is a reduction of 2.90 percent. The question that I have is, you gave us two scenarios. One scenario is if we don't do anything, and the other scenario is if we stay with 5 percent increase. My question would be, if we have something in the middle, I'm just give you a number like a three percent. Are we going to be more compatible to the other cities? Because now, looking at our rates, is probably the second highest in the area. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to point out it's just that first year we're recommending five percent instead of the six point seven five, but then thereafter it's two point nine percent. And what I want to point out is on that chart we showed you earlier, in the last year, those reserves dropped to just to the point of the bare minimum. So in other words, we brought that number down as low as we could and still have a workable plan. So what we showed you with those two alternatives, to do nothing and then our lowest rate that we could make everything work, uh, at, and it happened to be at that inflationary level, 
If you recall, the operating expenses increased about 4.3% per year, and we're recommending 2.9. So what's happening over time, we're gradually spending down those extra reserves that you pointed out to make this rate plan as low as we can. The reason I'm saying this is because when we're building the outer plan, one of the promises that we made to the people is not only we're going to have independence and we'll be in control of our water, but also our rates are going to be lower. So I want to see if we can actually, uh, re you know, deliver what we promised. I understand, Mayor, and I was there speaking, and I got those questions a lot, and I always was very careful to answer them by saying, I can't promise you to lower the rates, but what we will do is control the rates, which means those future increases should be less. And that's what we're presenting to you tonight. Things go up in cost over time. We have a much higher quality treated water than we did before. In other words, it starts as salty water. It comes out as pristine RO treated water. That is a more expensive process. But we've been able to control those costs very well. I believe if we hadn't done that, if you look at our past increases of almost 10% per year, it's much, much less. So sure. it is consistent with what we presented to the public uh, when we went out. I do understand your point, and we want to work with you on that. And we're presenting what we believe is the lowest uh, increases, inflationary level, that we can sustain and still invest in our infrastructure. I think that's important. I mean, we could cut way back, but then we wouldn't be doing the things that we need to do to keep our community the way it is. Just wonder how we're going to stand compared to the other cities after they do their uh, adjustments as well. well I can guarantee you, that, you saw, you saw yeah. the chart of what they're doing and uh, the ones looking at it and you saw the average of five of them, whatever is going to be between four and 11. We're going to be at 2.9. So they're going to catch up to us, those ones. The ones that are efficient to us, and I'm not going to name the cities or stuff, but you read about them in the paper all the time and their infrastructures, um, you know, falling apart and they don't have the money to fix it. So this is going to, again, this is one of those things that was kind of scary becoming a new city manager, proposing those 10 year rate increases. But I think coming out afterwards and only going to inflationary for the next 10 years is way farther better than the best scenario that we could think of. Um, it worked and it took a lot of team and building that plant to work, but we do have it at the lowest point that we can do. And inflationary for the next 10 years, you'll watch all those other cities pass us because they didn't invest in the front end. It was hard for that commission, that commission to decide. And I think some of you may have been on there. So yeah. It was hard to be on that commission to do those 10s, 9s, 8% increases, but we told you we need to be ready because of our old infrastructure. Um, this shows your wise judgment because we're not even only there, but for the next 10 years, we can go at inflationary rates, do all the, do all the pipes and do everything we needed to do and, uh, have that. So we are very happy, um, of the results and what we're all, that what we're offering is the lowest way we can do to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Then a commission comment. Commissioner Kick. Thank you. I want to thank you all for the presentation. Um, I, I know when we were building the plant, I don't remember. I don't remember ever saying that we were going to lower our lower, lower our rates. I, I I know I would have promised that, but I don't remember Mr. Smith ever saying that either. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let me just understand. So we're at six point seven five now, and we are lowering to five percent or are we adding five percent we're lowering correct for one year for one year and then we're going to add on 2.9 and inflationary is usually what three percent anyway so we're right there so um i would support this plan and i also support um the suggestions for the staff adding staff and whatnot because uh we do need feet on the ground um, um, and i know we need help out there um i think this is uh, a good plan and i'm, I'm happy to hear that this was already um, looked at by the Budget Advisory Board. I'm happy to hear that um, because we rely on them as well for their um, expertise. So thank you all for this uh, hard work and putting this plan together for us. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Panther. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Paul. You definitely, as we talked about in the proclamation, you helped Tarpon be a leader in water, and I appreciate that, and water independence for us in the county. 
is a very big deal, and you are a big part of that, so thank you. Um, I remember seeing these numbers a few years ago. It had to been three or four years ago. Um, and uh, now, 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 now that we're coming closer to uh, to uh, 2020, you know, I definitely would be more in favor of you know the proposed increases. Um, well, it's not an increase because it's 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 6.75 percent, and then 5 percent, and then it reduces to 2.9 percent from 2020 on to the 10-year period, correct, or eight-year period. So we're actually reducing it. Yeah. So instead of yeah. 6.75 next year, it will go down to five. But if we did nothing, 2.9 thereafter. By 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 ordinance, it would go to zero. Correct. If we did nothing, obviously. Okay. Well, as I think Tarpon's been very very prudent. While we don't always have the lowest millage rate, where we we are a full service city, and I do think residents will complain far less about they're gonna they're gonna be paying less. First off, with this proposed plan. So we'll complain less about paying a few dollars for something as opposed to we don't charge anything and then run in a, run, run in a deep hole in five years and have no reserves left. So um, I've, I appreciate this analysis and all, and all this work, and I um, definitely would be in favor of your proposed plan. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seaver. Yes, uh, I uh, also agree with my colleagues, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Banther and, and Sue Slattery. Thank you for the presentation, first of all, and, Thank you. and for your forward thinking and proactive thinking always because you always put us in a position where we we are ahead instead of trying to catch up so I appreciate that and I do support the plan as well thank you thanks mayor uh, I've got a couple questions uh, mr. Smith thank you for your time and presenting us to us uh, always appreciate the time that you give me um, and our conversations when you talk about the history of our water department and where we're going and where we're heading um, uh, it's good not to be in news for the bad things, but then also getting the awards that you have worked really hard for. So thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you. Um, with that said, I'm going to need to sit with you some more to understand um, these added positions, uh, adding six positions currently to our budget. Um, I, I can't wrap my head around that yet, uh, but I look forward to learning more about it. Um, I do have a question, though, about the other areas' debt ratios, because what I'm looking at is the best practices is at 2%. We're at 3.56 right now. And then the proposed, we're going to stay at 3.9. And then if we had did nothing, we would drop down to 1.2 by 2028. And I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what the mayor was talking about. Is there an in-between that we could look at? removing an, the inflationary rate somewhere if it's 2023 and 2026 or something along those lines to where we still fall in line with the best practices that was presented to us tonight, but then we're also not cutting ourselves short with capital improvements that we need to be making on our aging infrastructure as well. Very good question. I'm going to ask Ron to back me up. Besides, you haven't gotten to answer many questions well, yet. So. <laughs> but I know it's a multi-point test. And what I'm going to say is it isn't just that one index that you're looking at that makes the rate plan um, solid. So, Ron, if you could elaborate, please. Well, I believe you're talking about the bond covenant, uh, the the 2.0. Yeah. Okay. The minimum's 1.1. I could say I, I really get a little queasy if you start even to get down to the 2.0. I'd rather keep it up as high as possible for emergency situations. I mean, you don't want to become too close and you're in technical default with the bonds. Because if you do that, then it gets notified to all the bondholders and affects your credit rating. So, you know, the higher the number, the better. I'm comfortable at like uh, 3.0. I just when it, if it start getting below that, I would start getting a little queasy and stuff if uh, we got too low there. I'm not sure if that's answering your question there. But. Yeah, it answers it, but I mean, the target here, it shows that it's closer to four, and so that's why I was looking at there's an option. Well, and they're trying point. to combine, you know, when you're looking at trying to keep the minimum fund balance, and if you looked at the graphs in the last year where we're getting down to the, we're, you know, trying to combine the bond covenants and also the minimum fund balance requirements. So if, as you see in the graph on the last year, we're getting close to the minimum fund balance in the last years of that graph there. So you're trying to combine, you know, minimum fund balance and the bond covenants when trying to work with the, uh, with the revenue rate study, you know, trying to throw in, you know, all the CIP you need. You know, if we were trying to adjust it, we'd either have to cut back on some of the CIP to be able to try to get down and reduce some of that, um, that 3.9, I believe you're looking at. Okay. And get us more above the fund balance minimum. Uh, so if I may, the, the plan was designed so as to not 
um, project the need for any future borrowing. And so in order to do that, in order to cash fund all of the capital, rates have to be at a certain point to generate that level of revenue. And so uh, in order to avoid borrowing, we're actually coming in with the coverage that, that keeps us between the 3.5 and the 4.0. And I will say that 2.0 is uh, kind of be a best practices minimum, but I'll also say that I know the rating agencies will also look at you know, behavior from year to year in that coverage. So if you're showing a five-year plan, let's say, and you go from 3.5 to 2.0, even though you're at 2.0, you're probably still going to have to answer questions relative to why, why exactly are you generating less revenue relative to the amount of debt requirement that you have. And so it's trying to balance all those things. And so the plan that, to what Paul was saying, the plan that was presented is the lowest inflationary plan with, re with respect to the the uh, minimum reserve fund balance, that 25% by the last year of the plan, while also not issuing any new debt to fund the capital requirements that have been identified. Okay. I and again, we got a lot of time, uh, you know, to get with any of you on the board to go over these a little further before, obviously, the two readings we want in May. So we have plenty of time to get together or bring a consultant or talk with them and get you all the information, anything else you need on that. Yeah. Thank you for that information. Uh, we're we're going to want to connect, I think, a little bit more. And thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, I know people reach out all the time about the quality of the water, and uh, I'm reassured with your leadership that you guys are doing a great job. And so thanks again for everything you're doing. Look forward to it. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. Also, like I'd like to add that we have many projects in progress relating to the water and to sewer. So I want to make sure that already covered if you understand that thank you are there any public comments on this item Here we go. man this is a great water month today all right Peter Lax 514 Ashland Avenue a uh, couple questions I would ask with regards to uh, when I look at these graphs uh, with the do nothing, it shows <clears throat> some debt service beginning in 24, and I know the projected plans were such that on the new proposed uh, rate structure, there wouldn't be no debt service at that point. So I have a, basically, I guess, a couple questions to look at is when do <clears throat> the current bonds that we have outstanding uh, expire such that there would be no further uh, debt service requirements needed. That would be, I think, something that would meet, be looked at. And secondly, even in the best projections as possible, uh, you don't show any long-term borrowing, but if there was need for long-term borrowing somewhere down the line, where would that borrowing come from? Would that be the need for the issuance of new bonds? Uh, where would we have to go for that borrowing. And thirdly, uh, what effect do the uh, bond rates or the, the rates have when other city departments borrow money from the water and sewer fund? How does that affect not only your reserve but your rate structures? And uh, I would say that uh, preliminarily looking at uh, what we have here, this is very uh, manageable. Secondly, as some will be aware, uh, these are projections. And I think the last time we did this, when Mr. Burton was here and I know was on the board, which was back in 09, which would have been fiscal year 10, they were those 10%, 9%. And we have gotten it down where we can control our rates. Uh, so. What I would say to Commissioner Carr and the others on the board is you're doing your best at this point to somewhat project the future. But if the future changes, we know that our city manager and our water sewer project leaders will come back for you and say, this is what we may need to change at that point. So at this point, you're just really looking at a preliminary thing. There's no way you can tell 2028 
what the inflation rate's going to be. And if a lot of the tariffs and other trade war things start going through and you need certain specific equipment, uh, you may find yourself out of that 2.9% rate. So I would wholeheartedly accept this, but still would like to get a little further questions answered with regards to uh, those future needs. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other comments on this item? Hear none. Well, thank you, Mr. Smith, Mr. Herrick. Thank you. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda items. Number five is the uh, satisfaction release of liens. Number six is the attorney fees. Trash, trash and uh, diagnostic invoice 55728. Johnson and Jackson invoice 2404, 2405, 2406, 2407. Number seven is special events. Rock the Docks, Block Party, April 28, 2018. Eco, uh, Ecofest on uh, May May fifth. Cisco the Mayo Bejo. Cinco. Huh? Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. Okay. Uh, on Athens Street, that's May fifth. Elk Lodge Beach Party on uh, May twelfth. Tarpon Fest Music Fest. This is on <laughs> the uh, June twenty third. Item number eight is the award file number eighteen zero one zero four. CJJ Electrical Lighting Data Communications and Security Products and Related pro uh, Product Services and Solutions through the um, U.S. Com uh, Communities Purchases Alliance Control. Number nine is the award file number 180099 and CM Single Source Purchase of Ford Original Equipment Manufacturer autom Automobile Parts and Services. Number 10 is review file number 160054CM, maintenance, repair, and operations, supplies, and related services through National Intergovernment uh, Purchasing Alliance. Contract number R142104. Number 11 is the award file number 180094CCM, utilize the National Joint Powers Alliance, contract number 031517. TIS, Facility Security Equipment Systems and Services with Related Equipment and Supplies. Number 12 is the award file number 180098, NRS, Single Source Purchase of uh, VTAC, Z, uh, 1400 Scale Inhibitor. Number 13 is the award file number 180097, NRS, Single Source Purchase of Gale Flow Lime System Parts Services and Chemicals. Number 14 is renewed file number 140059, CJJ Landscape Contractor Services through the City of St. Petersburg, RFQ number 7563. Number 15 is the award file number 180106, NRS Single Source Purchase of Corrosion Inhibitor. And number 16 is increase file 150079, CCM demolition services utilizing Pinellas County contract 1230353B, KF. Any of the items that you like to pull? I don't want to pull one. I just wanted to make a comment on one. Which one? Uh, D, 7D. 7D. The Elks Lodge? Elks Lodge. Okay. I was wondering if this is going to be like the Boys and Girls Club used to have, because that was so much fun, and yeah, I was it, excited it, when I saw this. I know. <laughs> we're finally bringing it back, because we used to do it in conjunction with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, this is um, a fundraiser, and it's with a new, it's a 501c3, I forget the name of, but they used to be with, with the um, Boys and Girls Club. They've kind of branched off, and so all the proceeds go to this 501c3, which helps children in the community um, pay for equipment for different sports they play and, and different yeah. activities that they do. So, again, um, it, it's the same exact concept. Yeah. Uh, there'll be music. Uh, I think it's $20 a ticket, and there's food and um, yeah. beverages provided in that, and I think it lasts till. 
10 o'clock p.m. So, yeah, it's a, great it's, to bring it back. Yeah, it's, it was always a fun event. Yeah, so, so I hope to, I hope you uh, you guys can come out because it's, it is it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to bring the community together. It's a good thing to support for the community. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's good. Thank you. Any other comments? No. Are there any public comments on these items? Here to Locks 514 Ashland Avenue. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address the board. I would like to bring your attention to items 12, 13, and 15 at this time. Uh, single source purchase of scale inhibitor, which is for the reverse water osmosis plant. Uh, 13 is a CalFlow lime with chemicals for the reverse osmosis plant. And 15 is the purchase of corrosion inhibitor. All of these three are items that include chemicals that we'll be putting into our water. And I would just want to know if the board has had any discussion with our water department or has there been any uh, publications or information put out to the general public with regards to the safety and efficacy of not only these chemicals individually, but in combination with each other. So those would be my concerns or questions on those items. However, I am a little concerned about item 16, which is for the demolition and abatement services utilizing Pinellas County contract. Now I can see the FSC again in providing this as a piggyback to a current contract. However, if my memory serves me and the item on the CRA agenda, there is a demolition request. Such being that this request is being done out of the city commission BOC meeting and not the CRA, I would say a point of order that this item needs to be on the CRA agenda and an item budgeted out of the CRA and not the city because supposedly this is supposed to be all a city uh, correction a CRA uh, aspect so I do feel that uh, basically this item 16 should be pulled and possibly redone such that it does qualify as a CRA uh, expenditure and not an add-on to the demolition uh, portion of what is currently be budgeted out of city funds. Thank you. Well, thank you. Go ahead. I do have a question about that, that last comment. It is again on the CRA agenda. So is it not correct that it, it will be budgeted out of the CRA? Yes, it will be budgeted out of CRA. All right. But the contract that we have, when we did the original contract, as you see in there, was for up to $20,000. We've already spent just over 10000 of it. So to even go and utilize them, whichever pot of money it goes out of, you need to increase the contract, which is what we're doing now. So if you prove the item, otherwise we have to come back and do the opposite. So all this does is, again, you know, we gave them about $20,000 because we didn't anticipate some of it. We spent over ten. So we're increasing that amount, whether you do it or turn it down later on we've still got an increased amount to be used of course only if there's demolitions um a demolition the money for it is going to come out of the cra as you'll see in the cra agenda and that's what you'll prove in the cra agenda the money to pay for it uh, with that in the budget thing so okay. this is from purchasing was added in there is the proper way to do it or otherwise you'd have to increase the contract okay. and you're doing that now to anticipate an action i just wanted to clarify that okay. thanks any other public comments on this item? Items? Nothing. <coughs> the chair will entertain the motion. Motion to approve. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Merrill Hooses? <clears throat> yes. We are now going to the item number 17, which is the word file 180090, <coughs> CRS Hydrant Involved Installation Repair and Maintenance through Seminole County, contract number 1FB602347-15. <coughs> GCM, staff report. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. This is a recommended specialty contract for hydrant services. 
and it's something we're doing in, in partnership with the fire department. They concur with this uh, recommendation. It involves a very detailed analysis and testing of each, each of the hydrants. And based on the results of this testing, we're able to put the appropriate paint colors on the hydrants so they're in just instantly recognizable by their capacity. But also it gives us the opportunity to have a prioritized work plan. The contract also provides for repair services, which does include the parts. So it gives us options here, depending on what we find in this detailed analysis, to move forward in a rapid manner to address any issues that we may find. So for those reasons, we recommend moving forward with this. I'd like to say I understand there was some question about whether staff could do this themselves in-house. This would involve additional resources, and in the essence of time, I recommend moving forward with this assessment on contract with our long-term plan of being getting that staffing on board that we talked about, getting the appropriate training in place, and, and moving that in with the regular work. So that's my recommendation to you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Do we have a routine maintenance schedule to maintain the fire hydrant? Historically, this has been shared between the fire department and the city's water distribution staff. And I can say that I think we would benefit from a focused effort from this contract to do them all at once rather than sort of a side job. Um, I think this d deserves our, our focus right now. So it's a little bit different of an approach. Strictly for sale, and this is all when it gets down to the essence of it, um, safety. And to do this and do this comprehensive one instead of the schedule this year, doing this and this, I, it, it's time with the surprising number, 100, how many hydrants we have in the city? 1,260 something. With that many hydrants in the city and a safety to go around and miss one, um, it's just from the fire aspect, from my aspect of the safety, we need to do a sweep at one time and make sure if there's any problems we find them because we don't want to find them if there's a fire. And that's not the time we want to find the issue. So. Ultimately, when it came to the decision to do this and do it in this way, where they convinced me right away was on the safety aspect for all of our citizens. Mr. Smith, after we complete this project, then we're going to set up a schedule and, and main a schedule? That's our so plan, we'll Mayor. Do them all in once? Well, and you'll see in the CIP, we, this is a long-term plan for us, but initially we want to use the contract services, and where it makes sense, we'll start bringing our own staff in to do this work. Um, as you may know, we're already doing that with our meter replacement program, right. but we've been working on that for years and years. Um, this has a higher level of urgency, as the city manager said, with safety right. that uh, we're, we're recommending this approach. My other question I have is we have many uh, private communities. Do we test in their hydrant? Do we testing who's? On, we have many private communities in Tarpon. Do we test in their uh, uh, hydrants there in the local area, I mean, in their private areas? I believe Private they do, communities. but Craig? Yes. Uh, we test, the fire department tests all the hydrants in the city. So we test all the private hydrants, all the public hydrants. We even test some of the county hydrants as well. So um, we just don't do any of the repairs. So if the private hydrant has a repair or bring, then we would bring that to that private community yeah. and they would have the cost for repairing it. Sure. But the fire department does have to go out and spin and test those hydrants for ISO purposes. And that's sure. one of the things that this will help with too, is help us maintain or increase our ISO rate. We want to make sure it works if we need it, yeah? Correct. Thank you. Any commission comments? Commissioner Kidd. Thank you. Um, I had spoken with um, former Chief Butcher about this quite a few years ago, and we went back and forth on it because I know um, there's some cities that had a crew that went out um, to test the hydrants and our city was utilizing our fire department and I'm like, well, how are they, you know, how can they do this? They're supposed to be inspected. I think once a year every every fire hydrant if not more I'm not sure but I is it twice a year and so I mean that's hard to do and then they get a they get a call and they have to leave um, And if these hydrants aren't working, they have to be tagged and bagged and whatever There's just a process to it um, and I know that it's tough for our fire department to do um, hopefully uh, when we uh, increase the staff levels that we can have somebody that is just solely responsible for this because it is quite a it's quite a project and ordeal to make sure and again it is a safety issue for the city and we are required to um, inspect every fire hydrant in our in our city even if it's, it is in a private um, gated community or something that is our responsibility so 
um, this, you know, I think this is a great idea for now, and hopefully we can go back to our own staff um, uh, doing this service for us. But, but again, I, I know that our fire department was really stretched um, when they were doing these, and I don't think they were keeping up with it. Mm -hmm. And it is important for our ISO ratings as well. So um, I would, would support this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe there was a, a painter that went around about six years ago and painted all the fire hydrants in the city. I remember, I think it was an older Greek man in town that had the contract because I would see him with his truck and pull up to all the fire hydrants and he'd be out there painting them. So how often do these need to be painted and updated? Uh, or what's the record? Do you know what the recommendation is? Or I don't know there's an exact number of years. That will depend on how well the hydrant is prepared and what quality of paint is used, just like you would with your house. If sure. you give it a good wire brush preparation, address the corrosion, and paint it with a high-quality paint, which is what we're proposing in this contract, I think you could get a decade out of it reasonably. So uh, that's the plan is to, is to assess all these, do the proper preparation and painting, and um, really get into a maintenance mode where it's much more manageable. Um, this is obviously a very important situation. Uh, if my house was burning down and my fire hydrant didn't work, I'd be pretty upset by it. Um, is this one of the areas that these other positions that are being added on, or proposed in the water department? Is this an area that someone could come in? Cause I remember as a growing up in Tarpon Springs, I would see someone in a water truck come up and then release the valve and come back 15 minutes later and turn it off or so. Is that something that would fall under a preview? Or? It certainly would. I mean, uh, these are the kinds of tasks, but just like the fire department who have their other responsibilities, our water distribution folks have a lot of breaks, mm -hmm. a lot of service connections, and all these other things that they're working on. So this, when it's busy, it's hard to find that time to do this. So this is a way to get a real good jump start on this, get it going, get the staffing in place, and get it back um, to a manageable level. I just have another question. When they're, so when they're inspecting it, um, obviously it's, out of service, right? Um, there's an estimate of like 40% of the hydrants are going to need the upper barrel and 30% are going to need the lower barrel. Is that just industry norm based on age or how do we come up with that? Yeah, that actually, we got some help from this uh, contractor when you prepared a proposal. This company, Hydromax, specializes in this, so they see this all over the country. So yeah, these are industry standard assumptions. How do we prevent them? I mean, obviously they're getting paid for every hydrant they replace, right? So how do we prevent them just to say, we need to replace 65% or would you go off the in industry norm and say if you're over that, you might? Does no, it we'll be closely asking? managing this. Okay. In fact, part of their scope is their very detailed reporting and communication with us. Okay, this is what we see, this is what, and it gives us an opportunity to spot check and check these different things and make sure that it's, we're getting what we pay for. Okay, all right, thank you. Give him an iPhone, take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. Need a motion? Motion to approve. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Alhusis? Yes, thank you. Item number 18 is to approve concept for the uh, Poseidon statue. Mr. Liqueurs? This is one of my favorite type of items because it's not going to cost the city any money. So I love presenting these two because I'm always, always presenting you items that's going to cost money. This one hasn't. This all started, you see in the back up, there's a letter from Mr. Terry Safentinos mm -hmm. um, of Clearwater to the mayor. This is how this all started about him wanting to do and donate a statue to the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, I know the mayor had several conversations with him. Um, <clears throat> In talking with me, I just so happened to have a spot on the sponge docks, which is by the marina. You know, when, when you're looking for places for statues of that sort, um, the problem you have is you have very little city land and some places to put it. But we do have that little island by the marina. I'd always envisioned some type of public art or something going into that island. So Mr. Saventino actually came up and looked at the spot and... Uh, and like that particular spot and <coughs> what we're coming to you tonight for is he wants to, there is an an artist uh, a sculptor in greece that he wants to 
have do the actual Poseidon himself, which is a Mr. Kutuzis. Kutuzis. Mm -hmm. um, I do know from Googling and it all being in Greek, but the part in English was he did do some work for the, for the Olympics, um, some sculpturing for the Olympics in China. Um, the rest of it's in Greek, but he's, like, he's a renowned artist. So he wants to go over, the, he wants to contract because the actual statue of the person, Poseidon, um, is going to take about five or six months to do. So he wants to get that going. Um, after that's done and shipped, I'll be bringing it back to the commission because then we'll talk about the base and the actual form. Um, if you see in the back of the picture in the exact spot on the drawing, that's, what it, that's pretty much what it's going to look like. Um, but again, it'll come back in the base. What we just want to give him that you approve this consensus. It was brought to the public art committee. We have representatives from the public art committee out here. Um, and again, let me emphasize that this is all at the cost of Mr. Safentino, including getting the Poseidon built. And then when he comes here to get the base and the rest of it built and put up and donated to us. Um, the other nuance of that, as you know, Poseidon in mythology is related to the naiads, which you just approved to go into the roundabout. So there's a relation in mythology to him. So you have Poseidon at the head of the docks, and his sea nymphs' daughters or something will be at the end in the roundabout. So there is a connection to the public art in, in this and stuff. So, so if you give the consensus tonight, he is going to execute a contract with the sculptor to do actual Poseidon person statue. And then again, later on, we come back and we pick who's going to do the base and the final product. We'll bring that final product for you to review before it's put in and going. So Thank and again, you. we got the public art committee there who did hear the thing. If you want to ask them to, to, to add anything I'd like to, to ask Ms. Orr if you come to the podium, please, and tell us. Am I doing, am I Sherry Orr from 109 Colony South, but also the Public Art Committee? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Sevatinos came and presented this project to the Public Art Committee. We were very excited about this. Uh, one, the design of uh, Poseidon, uh, where it fits in our culture, and uh, the fact that um, it does match the naiads at the other end. So we did approve this in our committee meeting. And uh, the fact that it is not going to cost anything for our committee and for the city is also very exciting. So I hope that you will approve this. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Sure, go I just, ahead. I, I'm yeah, just yeah. trying to figure out how tall this statue is because from these pictures, it looks extremely big. <laughs> it's eight feet. He's going to be eight feet, and we'll have the base. We'll have the bay, so he fits between those two trees. If you see those two trees down there with a little trimming, he's going to fit between the tree. But the statue, the person himself is eight feet, and then he'll go to the base, which, um, again, we'll bring that design and have the total height when, when they do the base part. But he's eight feet. It just, it just seems so. so <laughs> well, it will be very impressive. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I, I'm sure, you know, and that's right, right at the beginning of the sponge docks. But I just was, you know, I mean, just looking at these renderings, I, I was like, this thing looks huge, so I just want to make sure, you know, because we'd have to make sure it doesn't block any views or any of that, you know, all that stuff. So. Yeah, that's why we're going to bring that part back. He, okay. he just wants the person, the, the sculptor to do the person and stuff, and then we'll bring that to have the total height, show you more dimensions, show you the base, because we know we got to meet within that space that we have at the docks. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zafatinos, it needs to have an approval in order to complete the contract with the, uh, with the artist. And uh, I know that uh, when we visit in Calibnos, we'll be able to see some of the work that he already has done. Uh, he just returned from Australia. He delivered some of his there in Sydney as well as Darwin. So he's a very, very famous artist. Uh, in the location, I think, is perfect right there on uh, between the two trees. And you can see that you will be able to see the statue as you're turning in from North Pinellas down to the sponge ducks, down to the, the deck. And that will be the first thing that you're going to look. I think it's going to be beautiful. Any commission comments? Any other commission comments? No, I'm just I'm excited for uh, this project and looking forward to it. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Commissioner Carr? I've just got a, a quick question um, for the city attorney. Um, so 
Poseidon is known as the god of the seas. I know we've had some conflict when I brought up some Christmas items along the lines of Christmas and Tarpon Springs. Is this going to create any conflicts or issues amongst uh, I don't know, separation of church and state? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, it talks about the sculpture would be made of cast stone material or bronze. Um, from my standpoint, it, it would be nice to see this made of bronze. Um, we're not paying for this at all. So I know there would be probably a difference between the prices, between cast stone and, and bronze. But it would be nice to see the, the statue matching the other statues mm -hmm. that are already on the sponge docks. Um, and that's, that was something that was written in the first picture. <clears throat> Um, that would be a recommendation on my end. Commissioner Carr, I um, really don't know the quality of the material, but I know for a fact that uh, I was, uh, we had a, uh, a, a telephone call discussion, uh, a conference uh, call with, uh, with the artist, and uh, he's willing to put the best materials possible because he knows it's going to be outside in the weather, near the water. He wants to make sure that the, whatever material he's used is going to be the best that it's available. Also, would like to say um, thank you to the individual um, that worked with the mayor on this to bring this forward. Um, I think it's a neat opportunity and would gladly welcome any other individuals in the area that would like to do art projects. And the price um, is right. The price is right. You're right. <laughs> the price is right. He is a very humble individual. I mean, I hope he, he's not in town now to be here and stuff, but he's a very humble individual that doesn't want much recognition. Just he wants to do this for the community. And, and uh, so I found him extremely humble and yeah. really not one, the most low-key person who's going to give something of tremendous value and cost to us and stuff. But usually people want something or something, but, you know, he he's a very humble, one of the most humble individuals I've met. So, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, has he done anything for Clearwater? No. no. He lives there? Okay. No, he wants to do it for okay. <laughs> But he lives in Clearwater. Oh, and I'm not telling the city manager or mayor down there. Yeah. <laughs> you, we're going to tell him after we're finished with yeah. the project, no. okay? Call Mr. Crudy Carson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other public comments on this item? Hear none. Uh, need a motion? Motion to approve. Second. In roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Merrill, who's this? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and now we're going to uh, the item number 19, which is the one is 2018-05 Heritage Museum His History Wing in honor of George Belitters. This is the second reading. And I will ask the uh, city attorney to read the ordinance. Ordinance 2018-05, an ordinance of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, naming a wing at the Heritage Museum building located at 100 Beekman Lane in honor of George Michael Bolieris, providing for modification that may arise in public hearing, and providing for an effective date. Second reading of Ordinance 2018-05 by title only was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on March 2, 2018. Well, thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Here none. Any commission comment? Thank you. Very much. Well, I have some comments to make. The last meeting we had, uh, there were many uh, people here from uh, the family of Mr. Bolares and some of his friends. They said a lot of good things about him, and I agree with all this, all these things that they said about him. He was a great person. He was a very good contributor to the sponge industry. He created made many videos, many commercials to promote his business as well as the city of Tarpa Springs. But Mr. Belarus, you should be equally honored as any other sponger that we had contributing to the sponge industry here in Tarpa Springs. I'd like to uh, remind you everyone that not to forget the history of Tarpa Springs and not to ignore the wishes of the people of Tarpa Springs. The history of Tarpa Springs telling us that of the founders and the pioneers of the sponge industry is Mr. John Cheney, he started the sponge industry, and Mr. John Kokoris is the person who developed the sponge industry and introduced the diving and bringing 500 divers 
from the Greek islands to Tarpur Spring. Let's not forget the hundreds of people who worked on and contributed to the sponge industry over the years. Let's not forget the many e emails that we received from the people of Tarpur Springs telling us that they want the Heritage Museum to be named as the Sponges Museum in honor of all the sponges, including the Greek Americans, non-Greeks, the African Americans, and of course, George Belleris, as everybody else, who they contribute to our history, to our local economy, and I believe that we should be fair to everyone. And the Heritage Museum, it should be named the Sponges Museum. And inside, we can dedicate a portion of the wall for Mr. Bullers and Mr. Uh, Samarcos, who had five, five boats in one time. As a matter of fact, seven. <coughs> Thank you for correcting me. Uh, I remember five when I was growing up. But... Also, um, the, uh, the boat that we have, the uh, Tarpa Spring sponge boat that we have, it used to be called Eleni. That was Mr. San Marcos's boat, too. So, again, that's the people's wishes. And uh, are there any public comments? I mean, any commission comments on that? I've got a comment. We're not renaming the museum. This is like the We're room in the museum. the wind. Okay. The portion of it. Isn't it like the room within? The wing also? That's like, just the one. No, no. That's as you're going in with the front desk, yes, on the right hand side. Okay, I thought it was like the when the Citizens Academy graduation area was, like the room that's back behind where we stood. Is that, no, am I not, not right now? No, that's the room where the, uh, where the podium was. No, the whole area. If you remember, as, as I told you, um, this was going to be on the entrance where you go into the banquet hall, into the room. Um, that part of the museum as you walk in. Um, I also told you because of some of the concerns from the people and stuff that we would be looking at where the room is that you're talking about in there, that we would do something to honor uh, the people that he had just mentioned. Uh, that, that area going into that place within the thing is where, is where I said that uh, Tina Bucavallis would look into making sure she had everybody she couldn't do the dedication somewhere in the room. Um, so this would be as you walk in and go to the right, and before you enter, what I call it a little banquet area, which is also a museum and stuff. The the plaque would be at that at that door going into there under, under the present plan. Uh, this isn't really the time to discuss this, but I I feel that we've got the historic train depot as a museum. We've got the heritage museum in Craig Park, and we also have the old city hall. And I don't know what we call it right now the Culture Center on Pinellas Avenue. And we've got three areas where we focus in on some museum type aspects. Um, I think it would be probably prudent from the city to look at maybe consolidating some of these at some point or looking at a area to honor the sponge industry and the history of Tarpon Springs and also the, along with the history as well instead of <laughs> having them separated. And then we have, our, we have limited resources with volunteers that could open these up during certain times of the day um, so it might be, could be a good idea to have a, a further discussion about maybe relocating some of these items and um, really having a focus plan on museums within Tarpon and how do we utilize these city properties um, and maybe how we could look at some other revenue opportunities for these properties as well um, for events for, uh, we could target that down the road. But And, and we could, um, we are going to start looking at that when we, you know, when we get it ironed out about how we're going to do the cultural center. And after we do that, we're going to, you know, Commissioner Banthard requested a while ago, we're going to look at what we do in that building. And at that time, I think that's when we need to have the comprehensive, what we're doing there, what we're doing heritage and all that. Um, and that would be a good time. That was the time when we had planned, um, when we were having discussion about the cultural center and the uses to do all the buildings and look at it just how you were saying um, at that time. Yeah, I understand that. Um, Our, our last conversation, I mentioned the fact that there was a wing to honor the sponge industry and the spongers. I think that's an important part of this wing. Um, if there's an individual's name before that, it, it doesn't, I don't think it really takes away from the whole sponge industry. Um, I know there's a lot of passionate people that are live, live within our town that have got a lot of family pride. Um, and it's really 
we, we need to find the opportunity to honor as many of these families as we can through different ways that we can. And I know we also had conversations about a, was it Art Walk? Um, where we look at some type of history of Art Walk between the, the Sponge Docks, if it's Sponge Docks, Craig Park, if it's going down Safford, if it's going through Greek Town or however it may be. Um, again, that would be another nice project to see coming forward uh, to put intentional efforts into uh, to really show um, show the history that's the honor that's due to the history from all the people that came before us in Tarpon Springs. Um, but right now, I'm okay with with believing George Blair as long as it's honoring the sponge industry. Yeah, I think the one you agreed on the, the first reading was the George Michael <laughs> Blair's Museum to honor the sponge industry. That that's the one in first reading that that was the the vote. Any other comments? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your comments. And uh, I agree with you almost 99% that, you know, we need to have a place to honor all these families. And to my knowledge, until this was proposed, there wasn't really a central place. There's small places on the docks or, in, or, or private places here and there. But I think that this will create a central place to uh, honor all these individuals and keep the memory and hopefully... Uh, assist in keeping the industry alive by having a a uh, a single focal point of uh, of uh, honoring the industry and uh, it is you know though this is outside the purview of this ordinance I'm 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 assuming the room will will, will be such where it still be used for public events mm -hmm. you know more so around the walls and you know maybe maybe protruding somewhat thereof but it wouldn't be a room we would lose for events like the Citizens Academy <laughs> so. But I think just further, um, better, better, better utilize and underutilize city building that I had fun growing, 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 growing up in as, 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 as the library. I still wish it was the library, but that's not here or there. So I think this is a, a, a good use of, 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 of the space, and I do appreciate the majority of the board support on, 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 on the first reading. Thank you. Any other comments? Any public comments on this item? I need a motion. Motion approved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Al, who's this? No. Thank you. Well, that concludes the uh, regular session agenda tonight. And we go to the staff comments. Police Chief? Hey, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think it's important that I take a, a moment to talk about the recent law that was passed by the governor, signed into law um, regarding our our schools and SROs. So on March 9th, uh, 2018, our governor signed into law the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act, also known as seven, Senate Bill 7026. This law basically mandates that every elementary, middle, high school to include charter schools have a school, what they call a safe school officer on every campus. A safe school officer is kind of defined as either a deputy city police officer, a campus police officer, or a guardian. And a guardian is basically armed school personnel. Um, we've been meeting, the sheriff and the police chiefs, um, we met with the superintendent of the Pinellas County School Board, Dr. Grego. Um, we do not agree that the first line of defense should be armed school personnel that we do not agree with. Um, there is a funding gap. Um, the state did allocate some funds, but those funds are not enough to cover what we need to do countywide. I, I will say that we are ahead of the game, and we've always been ahead of the game because we have an elementary school SRO that rotates between all three campuses. So currently we have one assigned to all three. We're monitoring the other two um, with patrol, so we're, we're keeping a, a really stringent check on all these elementary schools. But this law was passed in a rapid fashion, and now we are all, you know, pretty much scrambling to um, get on board with this and, and get this covered. So I know that our city manager will be addressing this next month with you, but I think it's really important to get on the record that we are ahead of the game. We've always watched over our elementary schools, and we're even watching them over even more with our patrol division until we can get resources to cover these schools for the next school year. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any report? Nothing. City manager. Yes, just to finish up on that a little bit. Obviously, you know from my background that 
It is something real close to me. In fact, I remember 10, 11 years ago when I talked about the rotating elementary school officer, I got the looks, I got the, the things, well, you know, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. I got the arguments about, are they actually going to have guns and you're having them in the elementary school? I mean, I had all that, that, you know, whatever it was back then. But, of course, my idea was, you know, they need to have an officer to see what an officer is and what it's about. And, of course, I think our history of how our police and our kids have connected for all the years um, set the precedent. And we stepped out there all those years ago to have that rotating officer in the schools. Um, Obviously, I've been watching all this closely, and I will be ready when you get back from Greece to have some ideas. Obviously, we can't take care of the county, and we can't take care of what's going on in the state, but I will have to you when you return the first meeting a plan where we can make sure on the tarping kids. So that will be ready for you. Um, we've got this time month to get it together. We've already way ahead of working because we kind of anticipated this coming. So we will have something that first meeting because – You'll see why it's very important um, to make a decision what we're going to do so we can take action and uh, for our tarpon kids. Thank you. Deborah City Clerk? No comment. Thank you for being here with us tonight. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Vice Mayor Pell? Yes, thank you. I want to echo support for what the uh, Chief of Police and City Manager said. Um, I know I had talked to him after the incident in February um, that so that's something that we should do. and. Um, I realize we do get unfunded mandates from, from Tallahassee. That's just part of life. And uh, I do support what, whatever we have to do to put uh, two uh, police officers in the, in, in the remaining schools. I, I would have guessed the one that does the, the roundabouts would get, would get centered at one, and we'd hire two for the other. I think it's literal insanity not to have armed, armed uh, security at high schools. When, 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 when my office ha has more security than elementary school, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And we saw it work today in, um, in, in Maryland when there was, I don't know if it was a school shooter, but it, it, it was a domestic, I think, where the guy shot somebody and the SRO there stopped it. And that's, that, that's great. I think no matter where, where, where you are on the gun control debate, that is a mi middle, middle ground where we can uh, do practical common sense things to, uh, to uh, help keep, keep our, our kids safe. And, I, and, I'm, I, and I'm very thankful that you two have been um, ahead of the game on that, regardless of what, of, 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 of what Tallahassee said. So thank you. I want to say um, I heard my daughter did great in her school musical tonight. I missed it because I was here. Um, I, 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 I went to it last year. It definitely is a, a, a labor of love to sit through some of that. <laughs> But um, I got the text from my my wife, so Olivia. I I, I know I heard you you did did very well, and I want to thank also um, Chris Sprawls for um, getting us the funding for the um, spoil site for the dredge. I did not think that would happen. If I had to bet, I w I would have said no. I'm glad that he went ahead and did that, and I know Gus Bilrakis as well had a lot of help with the governor and making sure we didn't get vetoed. So. I'm very thankfully surprised at that, and uh, appreciate the board um, uh, probably being a little, little more positive than I was on that. So uh, I'm very happy that that's the case. And now uh, I think we'll, we'll see what happens on the, on the federal level, and we'll get we'll hopefully get this completed. So thank you to all involved in that. But thank you, Commissioner Kick. Um, thank you. I just want to um, just say that I would support whatever Chief's recommendation is with the gun control, um, with guns being in school or police officers being in school, I, I support that. I have um, nieces and nephews, ones in middle school and high school, that, you know, they talk to me and they're afraid to go to school. They're, you know, they'll call me Friday morning, this, this happened, what should I do, you know? And um, it's sad. It's really sad that, that these children are afraid to go to school. So I do not support arming our teachers. That, that's something I, I, I don't think I could support. It's not their responsibility, but hopefully we can get some help from the state and pay for some, some officers um, to be at our schools and to protect our children. Uh, again, it's, it's just sad that it's come to this. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what, whatever you recommend, Chief, I will support you. Commissioner Sieber. Yes, of course, I also uh, would back you up with, uh, with that. Uh, and I was very excited to hear that we uh, received the funding um, from Chris Sprouse. Um, we didn't receive it last year, and I felt that we needed to reapply because there was 
why would it hurt? <laughs> so I'm glad that we did. And thank you, Vice Mayor, for starting the whole ball rolling. But uh, at least we're going to step further and, and uh, we'll have the money for the spoil side. And then we'll see where we go from there. But uh, that was good news. And I'm looking forward to going to Greece. Mr. Fuller? No comment? Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to congratulate the Tarpa Springs High School Band Director, Mr. Ford, for being inducted into the Bands of American the Hall of Fame. And, Chief, I will support you whatever it takes to provide safety to the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, I am very glad that uh, the Governor Scott signed the, uh, the state budget which includes $676,000 for the Anklo River dredging. And I'd like to thank the state representative, Chris Bros, Congressman Gus Bilirakis, for their support and continued lobby for the city of Tarpa Springs. And I'd also like to thank uh, Governor Scott for taking my calls and listening to import, uh, the importers of this project. I think it's got title listening to me at times. <laughs> but um, tomorrow morning, I will be leaving, traveling to Athens, visiting our sister cities, Kalimnos, Halakisimi, and I will be meeting Vice Mayor Panther, <coughs> Commissioner Sieber, uh, City Clerk Jacobs, and Deborah City Clerk Manusas. We're going to be um, uh, having um, joint meetings with our sister cities and to be able to exchange ideas in regards to uh, exchange culture, education, and economic development. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, well, that concludes the regular session meeting, and it's adjourned at 8.21 PM. If you guys don't mind, I'd like to take five minutes break, and we'll come back <coughs> with the CRA meeting.
Okay. I now call to order the Community Redevelopment Agency meeting of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday meeting, uh, March 20th, 2018 at 8.28 p.m. Roll call, please. Chair Alahuzas? Here. Vice Chair Banther? Here. Uh, Mr. Sieber? Here. Member Kikta? Here. And Member Carr? Here. Thank you. Number one, item number one is the CRA annual report. Mr. LeCour. Karen Lemons will be presenting it for us as she does every year. Thank you. Thank you, Karen Lemons, the Economic Development Manager. I'm happy to be here as I am every March to give you the CRA annual report. Uh, state statutes require all CRAs to give a report in March for their uh, fiscal year. This covers the fiscal year of 2016-17. Uh, our CRA was created in 2001, and just so you know, it, there's a 30-year life to the CRA unless the county or the state would expand it, so our sunset year is um, 2031. Um, again, the goals are really to improve the central business district, to create private investment, and to reinvest the tax dollars that are created within the CRA back into the CRA. A quick look at the new businesses. Uh, we had 21 business openings this past year, three closings and four expansions. And the expansions are really important because when a, it's, it's important enough to retain your businesses, but if you can expand them, it shows that we've got a healthy business climate and um, we have a, a healthy climate to do business here in the city. Um, Currents expanded, Ambiance Hair Salon expanded, uh, All of the World Bistro went into an existing space next door and created All of the World Market. And then the Tarpon Art Guild expanded in the Taylor Arcade. And then coming up, some of these are already open, but there's a listing of several businesses that um, are opening in the downtown area. Um, Orange Cycle Creamier, I'll just point that out. That's um, our first freestanding ice cream store. We've been wanting an ice cream store downtown for some time. Uh, this is a hand-packed ice cream similar to Cold Stone Creamery. So we're excited about that. Um, Anytime Fitness is expanding, they're going to be taking over the old Family Dollar Building, which has been vacant for several years. We're happy about that. And then um, later this year, you'll be seeing um, Silver King Brewery is going to be purchasing our old fire and police station. So they'll be coming to you sometime before July. Uh, the incentive grants, we have two grants, the facade grant and the restaurant grant. Um, for the facade grant, we've approved 62 grants since it started, uh, 30 in historic buildings, so um, we're serious about renovating our old historic buildings. And the restaurant grant, we've had 12 grants um, in the past three years. Um, this is an example of a before and after, new and nearly new. This is the Tuscan Sun. As you know, there was a fire in the previous um, business. It's uh, been a major renovation. This is a list of the 12 grants we've approved for the restaurant recruitment grant since 2015. Um, they are all still in business. Sweet Owl's Bakery, um, as you know, has been replaced by Cafe Poli, but because of the renovations that were made in the grant, it was very easy to find a replacement business for that site. And then the economic impact. I think there's no question that these grants have made a huge impact. Um, within our CRA. We've had 74 projects in the past six years. We have expended about $400,000 in those grants, and that's resulted in $3.2 million in private investment, which is a nearly 700% return um, on our dollars. $711,000 increase in property values on those buildings that, were, that received grants from the application year to the current tax year, which was an increase of 7%. And then just as a comparison, the overall property values last year in the CRA um, rose by 4%. So um, our grant projects are doing very well. Then we had some public infrastructure projects. This is the canoe kayak and the shade structure. The Ring Avenue reconstruction, the parking lot should be opening next month. Uh, the landscaping project on South Pinellas was finished last year. Um, and there are plans in place now to do the northern um, portion from Tarpon to Dodecanese. 
And then for the residential, we've had the Villages of Tarpon. That was a partnership of the Housing Authority and Pinnacle Housing Group. Um, two of the four housing complexes are located within the CRA, uh, one on Lemon and Safford and um, Pine Trail Village right here. Then Anclote River Crossings, this is a um, development uh, near the Anclote River and uh, Safford Avenue. Uh, ten condo units were completed in the past year, and that development is now um, at its completion. <coughs> and then Ring and Center Street, this was known as the Eco Village Project. We're anticipating that construction will be beginning this year on that project. Um, uh, still remains 12 units and two buildings and two single-family homes. Casa Azul, they've been renovating that building. That was the old Bavarian Lodge. Uh, they're going to be opening up hopefully by summer with 10 rooms as a B&B. &B. And then commercial projects, we've got Lemon Street Trade Center. This is on the corner of Lemon and Levis. An 8,000 square foot uh, trade warehouse building will be bringing in about 20 new jobs um, and new employment to the downtown area. And one of our first new construction buildings um, within the CRA. Uh, this is Safford Avenue and Center Street. This is the old Kokolakis um, office building that's currently being renovated into a mixed use. Um, we have office retail and then we have a craft brewery that's going to be going in there. And Jesse's Garden, this is our community garden. I think Commissioner Sieber had brought this forward to us a couple years ago. We had the lease agreement finalized in March of last year. Um, it should be opening um, in the next several months. We've got the water lines in, the water meter in. Uh, the, we've got 10 plots that they've got in already. Um, the shed's been ordered, the sign is in. So hopefully we'll be getting that going this year. And then this is our vacant lot on Tarpon Avenue. We've got an RFP out that is due April 17th. And then our festivals and events continue to be successful with the first Friday um, in Snow Place, bringing a lot of people into our downtown. And then some future and ongoing projects that we're working on. Um, we've got um, an application for Wawa that has not yet been scheduled for any public hearings. We're not sure when that's going to be coming forward. Um, Spring Bayou, as you know, we're looking for development opportunities for uh, the former Sun Bay. Um, the alternate 19 corridor study, we've been working with FDOT and the county for almost two years now on that, and we're hoping to get some um, safety, efficiency, and some code amendments that may be coming forward to help uh, development along that corridor and make it look nicer um, and be able to use some of the amendments that we're doing to bring in some additional businesses along that way. And then Manatee Plaza has a new owner. Uh, we've been working with them um, on a shared vision for uh, mixed use on that property, um, and you'll be seeing in a couple months some land development code amendments that will increase the density to um, allow for more residential and even a hotel if necessary. And that's all I have. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm no. happy to answer. No, thank you. I just want to congratulate all of the staff and... Uh, the uh, business community for all this accomplishment. It's been a busy year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any commission comments, Vice Mayor Panther? Yes, thank you, Karen. I appreciate all that you've done. I, 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 I though I say every year that the improvements <coughs> we've made in the grants and all that we've done have helped revitalize uh, the downtown and the whole CRA corridor. I think one of the highlights this year for me is. Um, Holly buying the old family dollar, whatever it was called. And um, I, that, that area desperately needs a, I hate using the word renaissance, but I'm, I'm not sure of, of, a, of a better word. And hopefully she's the catalyst for that, and I believe she will be, and that we'll have some more, more higher end owners of the surrounding properties, and that'll just lift that up. And uh, hopefully one day we can extend the CRA more down off Tarpon Avenue uh, towards uh, US 19, as I know. As our as our as our buildings age, there are people that are buying up different buildings there and doing things to them. So I think that would help in the entrance to the the, the uh, downtown area. But thanks again, and um, I, I look forward to see what the, 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 this 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 year brings. Thank you. Commissioner Sieber. Thank you always, Karen, for all you do and uh, all the progress that we've made. Um, I appreciate your, your hard work. I'm excited that a new uh, bed and breakfast is coming in with some rooms. We desperately need rooms in, in Tarpon Springs and places for people to stay that are in a 
you know, within walking community of the docks and the downtown. So, but just again, thank you. Uh, just uh, follow up with the, the same discussions. Thank you for bringing this forward and reviewing this year. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Here none. I need a motion. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Four. Yes, I, I don't know. Do we approve the reports? No, no, I'm sorry. We don't have to. Text it's just starter. a report. We just, we don't have to do that. That's just a report. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> scratch that. Mm -hmm. We go to item number two, which is the approved demolition of the Sun, Sun Bay Motel building. And Mr. Lequeris is going to tell us about it. Again, I assume uh, as soon as humanly possible, we want to demolish the Sun Bay Motel. Um, we have already have our the people on contract as look at it. The good news is we had estimated up to 40000 possibly for that. Um, with this person we're under contract, we piggyback from the county contract and stuff. Um, the initial quote was 16000 plus there may be some asbestos, so we think it's going to be under 25000 So obviously, uh, uh, if we get the present owner stuff out of there early, which we're hoping to do, and get this guy ready, and if his mobilization time comes before the next meeting, um, I'd like to have this approved so we can proceed with that demolition. Any commission comments, question? Vice Mayor. Has he made any serious effort to remove anything? I mean, does he want to? I can't imagine that anything of value that was No, he's, he's working with Tom Function. They're hoping to get it within 10 days or two weeks at the at the, at the maximum. So if we if he does sign off on it, he's done, we can, so we, we, we don't have to wait the full 30 No, months. after, we've already got set up that if he's out and said he's going to sign something that he is of that set. That's why this may happen when you're in, in, That's fine. in Jake, Jake and drive the bulldozer. Okay. Yeah, I'm qualified. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to see cleaned up too. Uh, yeah, that was my question. Uh, how soon would it, do you think it would be demolished once we approve it? Obviously, he's got 30 days, but again, in him working with Tom Function, but he's hoping to get soon. out within 10 days to two weeks. And at that point, he'd sign or whatever we need to execute to turn the building over to us, and then we'd be able to do it. And like I say, we got simultaneously the construction, con the demolition contractor working on getting everything together, doing the asbestos study. He's doing that now. Um, so we could be ready to go as soon as 10 days to two weeks. Um, but I just want to make sure in their scheduling because that we can get it in a schedule the first opportunity that we can, and that may come before the next meeting. So just in case. I don't have any questions right now. Okay. I was just going to add, we can come back from Greece and there could be no Sun Bay Hotel. <laughs> I would hope that okay, I have a question. <laughs> so once it's torn down, we'll have that fenced off, correct? There'll be a fence around that property? Or? Well, we'll probably be talking about that in the next item. Okay. Any I, other questions? Uh, comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here to Lacks 514 Ashland Avenue. I brought it up on item 16, and here on this item, it's 16,000 out of CRA. Now, the thing that I'm going to put forth to the board is that little, uh, you know, you go to the Rays game, they got the three helmets there, and they put the P under there, and they move the helmets around, and the end, where's the P under the helmet? Which helmet? Well, my concern, and again, is all this shuffling of money back and forth. You approve money out of the city commission budget, and here you're saying it's out of the CRA budget, but in neither of them did I see some kind of transference of funds or any agreement with regards to that. And if there's going to be a continual transferring of funds between city funds and CRA funds going forward, Who's keeping track and are you getting reports of this? Same thing with the loans, the CRA loans. When we looked at this about a month or two back, where you already have an outstanding loan, you're already paying out to the penny fund. 
how much of that is left. I mean, that's, that's something I'm really concerned about getting lost in all the other excitable things about what's going to happen to this property. So I would just say uh, we need to make sure what's spent out of the CRA is actually CRA funds and not general funds and to give a proper accounting to the water and sewer funds and <clears throat> those who pay into that water and sewer enterprise fund such that uh, they are fully whole also. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? No. The chair will entertain a motion. Motion approved. Second. And roll call, please. Member Carr? Yes. Member Kekta? Member Sieber? Yes. Um, member, uh, Vice Chair Banther? Yes. And Chair Alahuzas? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Item number three is to approve <coughs> the lease agreement on the 61 West Harpoon <coughs> Avenue. Mr. LeCour. Mm -hmm. Yes. To, to start this out, I'll have Karen Lemons uh, <coughs> talk about this first, and uh, then I'll come try to tie in the vision um, that we believe that we want to give to you and proceed forward with. and. Uh, Get your response if that's the way you want to go as a board. All right, thank you. Um, you've got a memo and, and some backup materials in your packet, but essentially, um, you know, the city now owns the Sun Bay, and so we're looking at this as an opportunity to move forward and give ourselves the best tools that we have that we can to create um, a good development um, in that area. And to that end, um, we would like to lease that property, uh, the vacant land with the building on it. Um, to maintain the vacant land uh, in a nice way, and then to utilize the building as what we're calling a community collaborative center, an, an area that um, economic development, planning, and the Tarpon Springs Police Department can use, um, specifically in our, in our case to use to communicate in a, in a welcoming environment the plans and projects that we have going on in the city, um, everything from FEMA to HPB, the historic um, preservation initiatives, uh, the signage and beautification that we've been talking about, the Ultra 19 corridor studies, all of the things that we're doing in the city that people don't necessarily know about. Um, not everybody is comfortable coming into City Hall and the environment here. So we're essentially taking um, our city, our government, out to the people in an area that will be um, welcoming to them. Um, we'd have maps and displays, um, be able to talk to people about what's happening um, in the city and be more transparent um, about our about our government and our and our doings. We'd have our CRA reports and all of our information, our brochures, um, and it would be an opportunity for us to meet um, with developers on site there, meet with business owners, uh, meet with people who are looking for sites, um, not only in that area, but essentially when we're trying to recruit people to look at um, the Sun Bay and that adjacent property for a nice development. Um, it's an ideal spot to have meetings there right on site. We can walk the downtown, walk the area, and show them what we're looking at and, and, and what the area has to offer. Um, so uh, I've got a lot more examples of how we could use um, the property, again, with the police department. We're looking that they could use it day and night for um, whatever needs that they may have. Um, and again, it gives us more control over that area as we're looking to, to redevelop it. Um, the lease is there um, and a summary of it, um, along with a description of the property. Um, and so we're, we look at this as an exciting opportunity um, for us to move forward and again to have the tools that we'll need to be able to um, work aggressively forward to utilize the area and, and to get a development there um, we'd like to see sooner rather than later. Thank you. So vision wise and stuff, obviously we came to a long time. It was a long process and uh, we did my, make a final decision and purchase the Sun Bay. Um, but obviously after demolition, what are we going to do if, you know, my, my take, from the vote, and of course I represent all commissioners, so I do all sides, but my take with the vote is the key is to revitalizing the CRA and revitalize what many of you think is a neglected area of the CRA, the West Tarpon Avenue area. Um, so the vision is this, when that building comes down, first of all, 
the vision is to make it an oasis um, from what it is. Um, and even using, utilizing the property next to it in that thing. When we tear down the building, we got a hole in the ground. So having the ability to lease and work with that owner and have that thing, first of all, we can landscape and change that from what it is a ho hotel with the 40 year history from the time I started the police department, what it was there to look as great as possible with minimal money. I mean, we'll use city staff, shrubbery, we got tree money, some temporary parking area, which is nice, natural, environmentally, no paving and stuff. Just make a beautiful area um, for that. And while we wait, obviously, you know, we know we took the vote that um, with the money that we spent, um, the idea is we have to do that redevelopment and catalyst. Obviously, one of the biggest thing we need to do is take care of the tarpon in and hopefully have a developer come in and and finally do something with her. All the times we dealt with them, you know, that's one of Karen's great tasks. And of course, as you see from the CRA report, Karen, even though she came from Packer country, was one of the best hires that I did as city manager because you see all she's done in CRA with, with the CRA. But to really make this the catalyst, we got to have the, the people stop coming in and shine away because we need to do something, not only with that property that we bought and the property next to it, but we have to do something and bring somebody in with um, about the tarpon in. We had somebody in that we had a meeting with yesterday about that, and we're sitting in an office in City Hall. One of the things she talked about, the envisionment of, we would bring that person to that office and, and sit there, and we'd have everything on the walls, everything about the CRA, the Golden Crescent, the whole area, and show the effort um, for that revitalization effort. Um, you know, from the time Karen put that together, there's so many other uses. The, the amount of special events we have down there, we could use that not only for public work to play a staging area for all of our special events in that building. Um, we've got a lot of different things with recreation stuff we can plan to not only use that building, but that little property while it's been doing. Again, the goal is within a year, two years at most, to have all that redeveloped and, and start that. But in the meantime, there's just so much use we could do for that. So the first task we had is we're as we approve the property and we do this, is find out if we can get a reasonable lease. And obviously, we are paying the low price that that building was being rented. Someone was looking at that building to rent it again. The low price that that building was getting for, you know, we got it for the same price. And then to get the rest of the land, all we got to do is reimburse the equivalence of the tax money that's paid on that land. And so for that little minimal cost of, of that, we can make that air an oasis, utilize that building for, for the 12, 14 things listed. And I've, I've come up with about eight or nine more that we can do in the meantime there. Um, for instance, one of the things in the police wise for their bicycle, you know, we all talk about the, the downtown, the walking, the bicycle and stuff. Obviously, that's a better place than way over the state to have some bicycles and be ready for them to ride the docks in the downtown and do their thing. Crime prevention, Officer Ulrich can have the neighborhood watch meetings and the neighborhood watch in that area that he's organized. He could have the meetings in that building. Um, besides that, those are just some of the uses at night to write reports, whatever. Um, those are some of the uses out there. Again, there are also some catalyst events. We want to do some of the smaller things. When we had the fishing tournament, we could have used that property was ours to do some staging, some things for the fishing tournament. Just think of all the things going on at Craig Park in downtown where we could utilize it under our control. Plus, we can make it look what we want and and hopefully in a short amount of time that will either be developed by the property owner or somebody that Karen can bring in and just completely change the face of that. That's also the beginning of our route as we're finishing up and doing the sidewalks. Again, we're completing the sidewalks to Heritage Center. So, so that's our walking area where everything's going to start from. So that building in the meantime uses a catalyst. Obviously, we don't want to leave a little piece of that. You know, nobody wants to be in that front office of that motel and demolish the whole thing and leave a little piece there and go in. It's much economical and easier to use that little building next door and do everything from there than, than to keep that and do so. This is a good deal. We've got a bunch of ideas to go forward with it. Any other ideas that you can add to it? And it's an easy contract. We've, either party's got 60 days to get out of it, so you're not committed for a long period of time. Hopefully, we're shortening up the lease because we've got something to develop, or at least you know we start with development across the way of the tarpon. And so. We just see it, you know, we are asked by the budget advisory, where's your plan? Where is it? That's kind of our plan to doing this time. Also, with the good news that's added to this, the good news of the, uh, 
of getting the money for the dredge, I'd like to move up the the uh, Court Street project to do, we've got that temporary paving there, but now with that money, we can not only combine with this, but we'll have an area to move and get that street completely paved, the landscape and the stuff we talked about. We've got that money now in penny money where we can do Court Street, and I like to combine this into the six months a year, and then within the next six months, um, that whole revitalization and making that area look like an oasis to start that revitalization. So that's the plan that everybody has been asking for that we envision um, from Karen and I and and bring it for you to approve and work with us to carry out. Well, of course, thank you for the explanation because I had some questions and you answered all these questions that I had. Um, I, I support to rent the, uh, the vacant property and, and the little building that it's there. I think it's going to be very useful in, in many ways to use it as a community engagement center, but I also I like the fact that the police department will have a presence there. This is something that uh, I asked before, and I know that uh, Commissioner Carr asked for that as well. So I think it's going to be very useful. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, safety to the people and make more like um, more, they feel more comfortable that we do that. And I think it's something that we should do that. And uh, also that I'm hoping that uh, soon, <coughs> that we have uh, someone to, uh, to develop the area, and then we, uh, we get out of that uh, the contract. Uh, I know that uh, Ms. Lem is going to be working very aggressive to bring a development to the area, so I, uh, I'm looking forward to see that. And I support that. Vice Mayor Panther. Yes, thank you. Um, I think, well, in this, well, in this situation is perfect. This is a good use of the space in, in the short term. It gives us control of that area. It'd be kind of odd if um, that was rented out and we just had the one little, the sun-based space that we're tearing down. And in light of how we're trying to present this for a redevelopment and not, and not wish to hold on to this property for the long term, if I'm assuming the, the whole green space concept is, it is not um, acceptable by future boards. Um, and uh, I like the option that the, the, the use of the building is flexible and uh, police can use it as well. And um, I, I really just can only really imagine how much nicer it's going to look for Tiffany next year compared to, <laughs> compared to what it is now. We always talk about needing to market Tarpon Springs more. And I think this is a, 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 a well, I don't think it's coming from a marketing fund. It's a, it, I, 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 I think it's serving that purpose. So if you're going to, if, if you look at a lot of private development that's large scale, they always have an office on site. I think that, that 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 just makes sense, but this this is short term. That needs to be stressed. I think the mayor said that in in, in his comments, and uh, long term, this needs to be given to uh, to somebody else to uh, to uh, to uh, re, to uh, redevelop. And uh, I would like uh, updates towards the, towards the end of summer about uh, the conversations with the new owners of the Tarpon Inn, what their intentions are, and assuming as long as they're gonna. Remain in business there. That they're gonna um, not not only uh, apply to standards. We know how Sunbay cheated that often with the do band aid jobs and then tear it off, but go uh, above and beyond to better their hotel. And if we have any resources that we can help them through Karen to help them do that, so it'd be neat. It'd be, it, it it would be nice to review this, you know, on somewhat of a normal basis, not just annually. I would say every four or five months right now, and then hopefully. We don't need it beyond a year or two, so thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Cooper? As you all know, I was opposed to spending a million dollars uh, on this project, and um, but it's done. Um, the CRA is for redevelopment and, and increasing our tax base, and uh, we actually are decreasing our tax base and spending more money to upkeep this property and put it in a parking lot and, and also uh, maintain um, Mr. Hoffman's property. So. I'm not going to oppose this. Um, I, I, I'm not crazy about. I mean, the the lease for that little building is 6,600, but then paying uh, Mr. Hoffman's taxes, um, we bring it up to 9,900, which isn't a big deal. But again, we're losing tax space, and we're maintaining a property, and we're paying his taxes. So, uh, I would like to discuss whether we can do it for just a 6,600 instead of paying Mr. Hoffman's taxes as well, because I understand, you know, the benefit of this building and 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 what we're trying to do, but, um, you know, I I lease space and I don't pay the landlord's taxes, so I, you know, it's, it's just <coughs> it needs to be done. Um, 
And the other question I had was, uh, how do you plan on marketing that little building so that citizens do know what's what's there and, and what we're using it for? Yeah, we'll be using um, what we are currently using through our CRA. So um, I do retention visits every Friday. So we'll be going, first of all, we'll be going around um, with the flyers, telling everybody what it is um, on Facebook. Um, I do a monthly e-newsletter that goes out to about a thousand people, so we'll be getting it out there. Um, we'd like to do a ribbon cutting um, with the chamber, the merchants association, have everybody come um, to that, so we can celebrate the grand opening and let people know it's there. Thank you. You might talk a little bit about how we did that originally. You know, it's easy. The building, what it rented for, the building rented for the five fifty. That was an easy one. We wanted all the land. We wanted the land, too, to have control of the land and stuff. I understand that. And so you try to figure out what that is. <laughs> the easiest way was, like, right now it's 200 and something a month in taxes equivalent or whatever it is and stuff. So the easiest thing to do if we're going to take control in it, that we <clears throat> there's no cost for that except the reimbursement for taxes. So that was what, able, what Karen and stuff was able to negotiate and, and seems to be fair. So we have control of all land, not just control that the little building. That way we can landscape and combine the landscape and in between we can use that property when we do the demolition we can we're because, spending money to landscape it and, and keep it up though and we're paying the property taxes so we're we're doing the owner a favor by mm -hmm. you know improving his property uh so why are we still paying the taxes and that's my whole objection mayor come here real quick can i go to the yes floor? then we'll go back Didn't you get thank you you finished the floor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to disagree. Come back to you, very yeah. clear. Oh, it's fine. I have to disagree what's being said here today. We already um, rewarded a bad neighbor, 800 and how much did we pay for that property? $65,000. So now Mr. Hoffman's had over 20 years to develop his property. And Ed, Ed and I go back a long way. But you know what? He's had over 20 years to develop that property. Now we're going to rent it back and beautify it for him. I just think this is absolutely ridiculous. It's going to cost us another $10,000 in a year so we can have his property. He can't throw a seat down and, and, and at least make um, and have no parking on there. I mean, that's something that we could have asked him to do as a property owner. Um, we have a cultural center. We have a heritage museum and we have City Hall that we can showcase our city at. We just talked about be these buildings being underutilized and we're gonna rent a building for $550 a month. I just don't understand what we're thinking here. And as Mr. Delacas pointed out, we have a loan from the Penny Fund. We also have a loan for the golf course as well. So we are robbing Peter to pay Paul for these expenses. We're borrowing money from everywhere. We don't, and, and it just doesn't make sense. This does not make sense to me. And so I will not support this. Um, we have an art show coming up. So they use that parking, that spot for parking. Are we going to rope it off and say no parking? Are we going to still let people park there and utilize that lot and the lease destroy will start it? At, the lease is going to start April 1st, which would be after that. After that. So, you know, it's just... I. I, I just don't understand where we're coming from with this. But like I said, we have underutilized um, places in our city that we just talked about, buildings in our city we just talked about, and we're going to spend $550. Plus, we'll probably have to do some renovations in there or something. I'm sure it's not all that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't understand what, what – I just don't understand this concept whatsoever. I know you want to – sell the property or develop it, but that's our responsibility. Mr. Hoppins had 20 years to do something on that piece of property. And we also paid for an appraisal for his piece of property because originally we were going to take it by eminent domain. So he's got a free appraisal on us. He, we're paying his taxes, part of his taxes. We're paying for rent. He's a smart businessman. He's smart. I don't know about us, but he's smart. So I will not support um, this concept. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Uh, taking a little bit of a different approach from Commissioner Kikta, I think it's a great idea. And thank you for presenting all the ideas that you've put in this packet. Uh, there's a lot of things that I never even thought of um, where the location is. And I, we have to ask ourselves as board members, uh, what, what's the vision? What do we want to see in Tarpon Springs? And this is the step that the city manager and economic developer has taken to make a deliberate effort 
um, to take the area of this part of Tarpon Springs and try to bring it into um, redevelopment and a greater part of Tarpon Springs. So thank you for taking that step forward. And um, we've asked for a plan and you provide us a plan. And that's another thing that I want to say thank you to. What's that? There's no development. Right, so I want to commend again the city manager for taking a step to attract developers here. Um, this is a great idea to give an opportunity for um, individuals to come in to meet with Karen or uh, Mark in this area. Um, the goal was to uh, attract um, developers in this area, to redevelop this area, and hopefully contribute to the city to raise the tax bases. Um, it's, this is less than $10,000. Uh, we proved close to a million dollars worth of expenditures tonight um, in our consent agenda. And if we, if this costs us now less than $10,000 for a year to lease this space to have control of it, it's, I think it's a great business move um, if we're able to get uh, these areas redeveloped. And it's really taking uh, the next step, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and then also beautifying this part of Tarpon Springs. This is a, a just like the Sponge Docks is heavily uh, visited, the Spring Bayou area is heavily visited each year. Uh, when people come to visit the, the manatees, you've got the art shows and you've got the other uh, things that go on in the area from Epiphany to uh, school functions where kids come and take pictures for prom and homecoming. And there's also the visitors that are there throughout the year. So these are areas that have been ne neglected for many years. Um, and it's going to be, I think, a refreshing uh, facelift to this area of town. Uh, one thing I would like to make a, a suggestion and a recommendation also to the city manager is there's not a good crosswalk. Um, on this, really on any parts of the bayou. I know the county has a lot of the roads around the bayou, but I do believe that the city can do something to improve the, you're working on a cross, the safety in we're that area. We're working on a crosswalk plan in that area for all those crossings for there. We are working on that now. Okay. Uh, because when you have a lot of people that are walking from downtown into the bayou area, um, I think that's an important part. I also, uh, like the mayor mentioned earlier, I asked that you look into doing some type of satellite uh, area for the police department, and I, I do support that as well. Um, as it was mentioned when Major Trill was here, when you have low rent, it could attract uh, or will attract um, not necessarily the best clientele. So it's good to have an area still to discourage um, any criminal activity across the street that may happen. Uh, and hopefully we could, the city could find a, 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 another business that could come in and redevelop that property as well. So uh, I'm in full support of this and I uh, want to say thank you for bringing this up and uh, moving forward with this and not letting it sit. Uh, for a long time. <coughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. And some yes, speak. just real quick, just just to I think point out something. And obviously, if you're opposed to this whole project in general, there's nothing I say or anybody would say that would convince you otherwise. And I have respect for that. But from a real estate perspective, we're not just we're not just paying his property taxes. If we just had control of that small building and not control the land, I would not support that. But essentially. The two hundred dollars a month in taxes that we're forgiving or repaying or, or or you know whatever, that's us renting that that land from him. It's essentially a land lease. So that's why I can support that. I would not support if we just rented the old hair salon, had no control over the corner. That would that would that that would be stupid and wrong. Okay. So I think um, regardless of how you voted to to buy Sun Bay or not, we we are in this situation now. And I think the quickest way to move these properties. Is to do like private developers do, and as we're doing here, is you have an on-site, on, you have you have a temporary on-site office to help attract people and, and and move this along. I think the best way to do nothing and for the city to just hold on to it, not be on the tax rolls, probably nothing happened to any adjacent properties, is to tear down Sun Bay and fence it off. That's ugly and doesn't do anything. Um, so if you're opposed to, to to this, I obviously respect that. But if you look at the situation you're in, what's the best what's the best way forward i think that is, that is a pretty good compromise so that's that's where i stand on you that, 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 that that's that, that that's where i stand on you know on this thank you mr stuber uh yes I, i'm not opposed to this concept um and as you said it'd be great to beautify that area and i agree it's just that it's not the city's responsibility to go around beautifying everybody's property uh and so i'm only opposed to almost 300 dollars a month in taxes now i'm going to you know support this I just wanted to, to say what my opinion was on that because I feel that it is the owner's responsibility to, to, to take care of his own property, not ours. And so I'm opposed to paying his taxes and beautifying his property and maintaining his property. Uh, 
just because I think that's not our responsibility and it's not a good precedent. <laughs> but I understand the, the concept. I understand what we're trying to do. Um, I, I don't know how we're going to man that uh, that little building. Are we going to take people from planning and zoning and putting them put them in that office, or what that situation will be? There's there's four of us um, that will You'll rotate kind of around, around. And, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I'm going to approve this. I'm just you know just don't like the uh, idea. Again, of, we, and we can we can talk more. It's written up contract. Really, we're really like he said, we're leasing. We're, we're leasing that for the 200, whatever the division is, it's take the taxes out of it. We could have wrote it up. We're doing this 550 and we're leasing the land. For the, we just want an equivalent. What was the land worth? Now, I'm sure if you rent out that piece of land, it's going to be a lot more than the equivalent tax money to rent that size of property and do anything with. We're just looking at where is a fair price to do it. And so even though the contract was written up that way to do um, and that helps us because the tax bill doesn't come to the next budget year. So we're only paying the 550 and we're reimbursing. So we're within this budget and this budget is the CRA helping us. But we could have just very easily put it 550 for there and 250, whatever it was for land to do it that way. The, the, the only equivalent to the tax is that was a fair thing to at least, you know, to, if, we're, if we're taking the use and doing it. And it's not a lot of things. The main landscaping thing to fix them is property is. When I tear down the motel, there's an ugly hole there and stuff. Well, I agree. You I, I have the ability to use <laughs> his area along with our area to make so while it may be on his property, it's really to beautify and enhance what we have left the motel on our property. It's not really to, to do his. Now, planting some seed and doing the grass and making that look more of an oasis or putting some shrubs, that's real simple, inexpensive, you, with, with staff, very little money to do. But... The beautification is more of to enhance our beautification for the plot of land we have than to make his property look good. Because obviously we'll have a strip where it goes down to put our landscape in. And of course, I do landscape instead of a fence because so we got to look good. But now if I've got his also and stuff, I can make a more beautiful, better landscape and really make that oasis we're trying to get. Little small items of things. The building, if we've got little things to do, we've got... As you see from all the work we do in house to the building, doing that and stuff. So we're not really giving them nothing there and stuff. So again, that's just the vision of there. We don't see it as doing that. We see it as utilizing the land and use it to enhance our property as opposed to enhancing his property. I get it. Public comments? Any public comments on this item? Tommy Frain, 624 Penn Street, Tarpon. Um, before I get started on this, just a real quick comment on the presentation as well. Uh, what the CRA has done over the last couple of years to downtown has been great, and I really appreciate Karen's work and Mark's work. <laughs> and I wanted to say that before I made any comments on this <laughs> specifically, because this plan, I wanted to come to the meeting um, with like an open mind after reading the agenda and the backup. Um, when I first read it, I thought it was like very bizarre when I was reading through it. I just, I didn't get it and it didn't click for me. Um, and sitting here, I was hoping maybe something would click and I still really don't get it. Um, I think there's a lot of divergent um, messages coming across, at least to me. We're talking about we want to have this place for development. Well, we know that no developer is gonna be coming in and purchasing just the Sun Bay property. So are we helping Mr. Hoffman, who, you know, I went to elementary school with his daughter, you know, known them for a very long time. So nothing against them. It could be anybody that owns that property. But are we helping that property owner advertise their own property? And then we're talking about Tarpon in, oh, but we're going to we're going to help them semi revitalize if they're, you know, on point with us or I, I don't know where we're going. I have, you know, I have my own theories of where if you look two steps ahead, and this was my whole fear with us purchasing the Sun Bay Motel, is that we're going to end up purchasing more properties in order to, to make more sense as we keep going. Oh, well, we have to do this in order to develop. And then, you know, and I hope somebody maybe in your guys' head you have some grand scheme, you know, five years down the road where this is all going to come to fruition. Um, and look, it's $10,000. It's, it's not a lot of money. That's not really the point. Um, to me, the point is it just, uh, you know, we talked about, 
a police substation if we didn't buy, buy the motel. And now I feel like we're creating a police substation even though we bought the motel. <laughs> so it's just, there's a lot of divergent messages in my opinion um, that are coming across. And, uh, and this may be a plan, um, but like ribbon cutting, I mean, we're making it seem to me, making it seem like it's this permanent fixture that's I mean, this great thing that people are gonna come down to. And I, no offense, I just, I, I don't see that. I, you know, if they're not gonna come here to look at pictures of, of projects, I don't think anybody's gonna go to the bayou. I think it seems like an excuse as a police substation to me. And I think that's because we all know that the Tarpon Inn is also a problem, that the, you know, the other apartments are still a problem, and that spending a million dollars really didn't do anything to affect the crime, so we still have to do something else going forward. And so this is more money, more money, more money. This is just a little bit that we're probing today, but you know, I feel like every step of this process, you know, back to when we were talking about eminent domain, it was hold on, wait until the next step. Hold on, wait until the next step. We got it. Hold on, wait. And we just keep going. <laughs> and we're not there. And I understand it's going to take a long time for development. Um, as I said, when I first started, it just seemed just a very bizarre thing to me. I'd almost rather we just do something really quick. If you want to rent the building, rent the building, but you know, don't make it this big grand thing and let's, let's just get it done off our books. We don't need any more properties owned by the city um, and utilized in that sense. So thanks so much. Thank you. Any other comments? Peter Lux, 514 Ashland Avenue. I know the next item will deal with the resolution to shift some monies and such, but I appreciate the gentleman bringing up the trickle down effect. I would have liked to have seen some kind of a financial statement <laughs> such that indicated all the costs. And all this, in the, you know, we can bring it up later in the next one about the attorney and closing costs, but how much did we eventually end up spending on that special attorney that we were paying 500 an hour for? I know the last clock was around, what, nine, 10, 12 grand? So where are we at on that? And now, earlier in the consent agenda, you approved an increase in spending for landscaping out of the BOC budget. So now is the CRA going to go and get their own landscaping contract or are they going to use the landscaping services from the BOC budget and get reimbursed? The CRA is gonna reimburse the city on that. Here again, where is that mingling of funds? How are you gonna keep track of it? Ron's got a lot, plenty to do already. And y'all are going to be busy with a whole bunch of stuff, so it's easy to get sidetracked. And as Commissioner Kick had brought up, you got the Heritage Center right across the across Spring Bayou. You got City Hall, the old City Hall, not two blocks away. Is Karen now going to be at this office? And I heard her briefly say there'll be four of us rotating through there. And Logically, you technically you have bought that property and I can understand the logic and your idea of using this substation, but here again, it's that 10,000 here, 20,000 there, closing costs, all this shuffling of money. So I would say, I'm sure it's going to pass. Uh, Y'all will do the best you can to make the properties attractive. Uh, but again, I, I just feel it's progressing down uh, an expensive way to handle this situation that could have been handled otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hear none? You need a motion? Motion first. Second. And roll call, please. <clears throat> Member Carr? Yes. Member Kikta? No. Member Sieber? Yes. <laughs> Vice Chair Panther? Yes. Chair Alahuzis? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know before is a resolution 2018.
0-1 CRA budget resolution staff report. Uh, Senior Attorney, you're going to read the resolution. Please. CRA Resolution 2018-01, a resolution of the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2017-18. Thank you. So I'll bring Ron Herring up. I know we've kept hearing about this shifting and doing the money and stuff, but I think people know my reputation. They know Ron Herring's, and this is not shell game or anything. This is all up front. Fine. So, Ron, go ahead and, ex and explain to him um, this portion of the resolution, and we'll deal with all the shuffling and okay. stuff. Good evening, Mayor time. Commissioners. Ron Herring, Finance Director. The purpose of CRA Budget Resolution 2018.01 is to budget for the items within the CRA fund, its own separate fund, the purchase of the property at 57 West uh, Tarpon Avenue, the demolition and other charges at 57 West Tarpon Avenue, leasing the property at 60, 61 West Tarpon Avenue for the six months, the, the remainder of the fiscal year, and uh, some, some more CRA building uh, grant program, facade grants to finish out the year, another $50,000. So all these expenditures are within the CRA fund and we're looking for your approval to increase the budget in the CRA fund to cover these expenditures. Thank you, Ron. Would you please explain that uh, the loan is 315 instead of 600? That was at the beginning. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me talk about that a, a little bit. Um, Again, remember when we were talking about how we were going to finance it, we said up to 600000 Obviously, we didn't know a lot of contingency, so we did up. Obviously, you taken taking 100000 off the purchase price, um, did a lot for reducing that uh, when we agreed to it for that. That was 100000 off the top. We've got half of the, uh, half of the uh, you know, we came in at a half price less for the demolition, um, so low, in fact, that we could do it within the CRA. We also had the advantage of knowing that it looked like the Silver King's going to get bought with another 125000 infused, which was an investment back into CRA. We've got that many available. So what I'm telling you here right now is that all we anticipate we need to borrow from the Water and Sewer Fund is, is not to the, up to 600000 It's down to three hundred fifty. This will enable us to pay that back in three years instead of four years without any effect to the CRA. And the rest of it, we're comfortable, and especially when that money comes in for the Silver King, June, July, or whatever that's supposed to be in, we still got plenty enough. We're also, as you can see in this budget, keeping our promise that, that there would still be money in the CRA to fund programs, and we're taking the 50 more thousand dollars because we're starting to run a little low in that. But we've got the money to put 50000 into that CRA improvement in case we get a bunch of grants coming in until October 1st and stuff. You know, it's kind of funny the way you CRA, you serve CRA, you do this board and stuff, but, you know, it all works together. Um, and these are the mechanisms to what you can do. I'm very happy with that 350000 That's going to be the, the only loan that we're going to need from the water sewer. I'm happy with the ability to be able to pay it back in three years to, to four. We explained the rationale about that. So um, this is how we're going to do it. It's a lot better situation than we talked about before. So we ask you to approve this this uh, resolution uh, to put the monies in the proper place. Okay. Mr. Lequeurs, I have no questions. I already discussed that with you earlier in your office. Uh, any uh, commission comments? Questions? No. Are there any public comments on this side? Beard Alex, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, one of my questions uh, with regards to the building grant program that uh, says 50,000 increase, is that to the whole grant program or is that 50,000 that's going to be considered to be used on this building and property as far as any grants towards fixing that property up? And uh, it's kind of interesting when you look at the revenues, uh, it doesn't show any cash carryover uh, under budget, but then all of a sudden there's $603 million on that cash carryover increase. Where is that money coming from if there wasn't uh, any carryover from before? So uh, those were a couple of things. And again, as I bring up, uh, 
I know these are increases in the CRA budget, uh, but I have not seen any uh, agreements or contractual uh, paperwork indicating uh, the terms and conditions uh, for these cross expenditures. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Mr. Harry, did you have anything else that you'd like to add on this report? Um, no, not at this time. Thank you. I need a motion for that. Second. And roll call. Member Carr? Yes. Member Kikta? No. Member Sieber? Yes. Vice, Vice Chair Banther? Yes. Chair Alhizis? Yes. Well, that concludes the CRA meeting. It's adjourned at 9.23 p.m.